and the protection of our cells, which is nonsense, um, to these, uh, these, um, these municipalities who have created organizations to uh, oversee their resettlement and, and good health and so forth. That would, that would be, um, and I think, a, a commission of an odd number of people, however many the, the council would think would be useful. Um, but I think that only if we create an alternative. In other words, if you, if you want something to be different, and I think we are pretty much in agreement that it needs to be different, then we have to create an alternative housing situation so that the federal litigators who are trying to uh, deal with the situation can have an alternative. I plan to go to Northampton City Council and ask them the very same thing and to encourage others in other uh, counties across the country and so forth because I think this is the only way that we can undercut the, this, uh, this horrendous uh, Im uh, imprisonment situation that we've all been witness to. Um, so I understand that the rule is you're not going to take it up at this time and respond and so forth, but I, I really believe that there are sufficient competent professionals in this community who could constitute such a committee, who could seek out and, and interview and so forth um, the uh, potential um, how, offers of housing. Um, and I myself have both been a, a, a recipient when I was a civil rights worker, the only white civil rights worker in the county that I worked in in Arkansas for a year and a half at some danger um, to the individuals. This was 50 years ago, and more than 50 years ago, actually. And I have, have been a provider as well for the last six years of a young man who, who came here as an immigrant, who is a citizen, but when he and his sister became homeless, I took him in and found an older couple in town who took his sister in, who has since graduated from UMass. And and finally, in terms of the large scale of things, um, when I lived in San Francisco during the Vietnam War era, after coming back from the South, um, I was the sole signer of a lease with a number of friends who were draft resistors and, and organizers and so forth. And over the space of two plus years, we took in 30 to 50 AWOL soldiers, sailors, and Marines um, without much problem at all. And we were all, you know, really 20-year-old kids. And so I think that this community is capable of, of organizing this effort. It is capable of putting it in writing, and it's capable of providing that kind of information to the federal litigators who are desperately trying to protect the lives and health of the people who are being incarcerated, the refugees and asylees are being incarcerated by the current administration. Thank, Thank you, you for your comments. Um, yes, Meg. Hello, everyone. Very briefly, um, I want to thank you. you your state uh, your name, please. Uh, Meg Gage, and I'll sign in yeah. in a minute. Uh, Precinct uh, District 1. I want to thank uh, Evan and Mandy for bringing up the uh, contribution limit proposal uh, and for defending it, and I'm glad it wasn't defeated. I wanted to let you know that uh, John Boniface and I are eager to bring, help our, the two counselors bring it back, providing support in order to both demonstrate the problem that it seeks to solve, which of course if you have a solution you need to know what the problem is, to make sure you're solving the right ooh, problem, but also to demonstrate the public support for this, which I think wasn't there. And that makes me want to point something out, uh, which is that just as you have a huge amount going on, lots of balls in the air, it's virtually impossible for the public to be able to keep up, know when things are coming up, show up at the right meeting uh, in order to voice their opinions 
And so I think we all need to work together to figure out how to do that better. I think it, the best way is community organizing, but that's a, a high bar for a lot of neighborhoods to reach. But I think the fact when people don't show up, it doesn't necessarily mean they don't care. When you don't get phone calls, it doesn't necessarily mean people don't care. So I just think that's a challenge we can all work on together to make sure people are tracking decisions that are being made. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Are there any other people with, pub with general public comment at this time? Okay. Then we are going to uh, move on. There are no proclamations or commemorations tonight, and there is no presentation or discussion. Um, we are moving on to what is listed as 7C. This is the Community Preservation Act recommendation for studio parts, apartment supportive housing, uh, 132 Northampton Road. Um, this is the remaining CPAC recommendation to be brought before the council. Since receiving this recommendation, the council has discussed it at three committee meetings, Joint Capital Planning Committee, which is a joint committee including representatives of the council, the library trustees, and the school committee. Their role is to recommend capital items to the town manager. It's been brought before the Community Resource Committee and also the Finance Committee. The council also held a full council meeting per the charter, section 8.1, the second half. That open meeting of the residents regarding studio apartment supportive housing 132 Northampton Road was held on Monday, June 24, 2019 at 6.30 at the Bang Center. In addition, we have made every attempt and I do mean enormous attempt, to post all materials, emails, letters, and presentations regarding this recommended project on the project page, which is at the amherst.gov dash or slash 3489 Northampton Road Project. My estimate is and it's really a conservative estimate that each counselor has spent no more than 10 hours on this issue alone, which is a huge amount of time. No less, no less than 10 hours. I'm sorry, thank you. It is, I, I wrote no less, then I said no more. Okay, it's no less than 10 hours alone, and that is in attending meetings, reading emails, uh, reading all the postings, et cetera, and talking to many people taking walks through the neighborhood. Um, so I'm going to start by calling on Steve Schreiber from the Community Resource Committee to uh, tell us of that committee's decision. So the only time the CRC has taken up this particular matter was on April 24th, and the vote at that time was four to zero in support of all the Community Preservation Act proposals. Okay. One, one absent, that was me. Okay. And Andy Steinberg for the Finance Committee. Thank you. Um, I probably won't be as, quite as brief as Steve. Um, the Finance Committee voted unanim unanimously five to zero, zero that the proposed project is sound, financially responsible, consistent with the purposes of the Community Preservation Act and raised no legal questions. Consistent with the committee's findings on other Community Preservation Act proposals recommended by the CPA committee, the Finance Committee recognizes that there may be other factors that the Town Council may consider to be compelling reasons to fund this project as recommended by the Community Preservation Act Committee or not to do so. Um, it is noted that is exactly the same motion that um, was offered for all of the CPA proposals this year. Um, and uh, the only difference is the amount of time and the depth which we, which we went in, into this particular proposal um, committee members uh, 
did not consider other issues that um, were not financial. Um, I'm not going to go into the lengthy report that is available on uh, the website from the Finance Committee, but we identified a series of issues that are financial directly related to the town and um, analyzed and discussed each one of them in our report. Um, as noted, there may be other issues that are non-financial that did come up a little bit during discussion and uh, members of the committee um, will, um, of course, as members, since they are members of the council, um, participate as they feel appropriate in those matters. Um, I'll respond to any questions that come up directly related to the committee proposal itself. The other thing that I wanted to note is that um, at the bottom of page five of the report, for those of you who have the report, it will note that uh, the Finance Committee did not study um, the um, construction and development costs that were estimated by Valley CDC. Um, we did not believe that it was um, within our area of expertise to do so, and we recognize that uh, Valley CDC has a right to um, seek um, funding also from um, the state Department of Housing and Community Development and the DHCD has um, the expertise to um, study that issue um, with a lot more depth than we would have ever been able to give to it so that uh, that was not part of our analysis. Um, Kathy, do you have anything you want to add? Um, as vice chair. Uh, what I would just add is Andy said there's a longer report and we also had additional documents that had been submitted to us that looked out 10 or 20 years at the financials in terms of the revenues of the proposed uh, project and expenses is one of the concerns or potential concerns would they at some point be coming back to build a new roof, build a bo uh, boiler system, and they built in into the way they're uh, proposing to run it, uh, we, in our judgment, sufficient reserves, and they've been actually quite careful to do that. So they answered a series of questions that I had sent over about current and future and potential related public costs such as road rerouting and we have answers to those embedded in our report. So that, I think that would be just the one thing I would add to Andy's report. And they did, um, the project did submit to us financials on the proposed building and the all the elements of the project costs that add up and uh, it's clear they're gonna have to go through a very tight review to get the kind of money they're asking for. They're asking for millions of money, dollars. Um, so that's a next hurdle that they will face where it's unlikely the agencies that, if they're willing to give them that money, would pay for excessive costs. So that will be highly scrutinized when they submit it. Okay, we're going to move to general counselor comments. Then we will have public comments. Then we'll, we will move to a motion and a roll call vote because this invo involves borrowing. It requires nine people in favor of it. So general public comment, I mean, I'm sorry, general counselor comment at this time. Dorothy. to hold down the whole time, okay. I am asking that we postpone this vote tonight because the major discussion has not been held yet. I have voted for it twice. I voted for it at the Community Resources Committee when it was one of our first meetings. We voted for the whole CPAC package. I didn't find out until later that the abutters and residents in the nearby uh, single family homes hadn't been informed of it. I also thought it was at a different place, further down Northampton Road. I had been trying to find the address closer to the uh, shopping on University Drive. So when I had done a drive-by, it had looked okay. We didn't discuss or go into any of it. We just approved it because it sounded like a good idea. 
I voted for it on the Finance Committee because, as Andy said, he structured the vote in a very careful way so that we were looking only at certain financial aspects and the examination was done and the appropriate answers were what come, came forward. And I kept saying, when can we talk about the service coordination and the management of the plan? And mostly I have been told that that will happen in the Zoning Board of Appeals, but I have to tell you I find that very strange. We're a new town council, and I think that we should be able to have this discussion now before we go forward, because once we voted yes, all of we council members, we're not going to be asked again to vote on it. So um, I have a lot of questions, and I have spoken to uh, Valley CDC several times, and late this afternoon, again, um, Laura called. So we have some areas where some of our ideas are moving closer, but we have nothing, nothing definite. Um, so first of all, there's been the argument about is it an SRO or a studio apartment? And after looking at the plan as presented, I have to say it is an SRO, it can't be called a studio apartment, because at present there's a rule that said that no residents can have an overnight guest. So. The only place I've lived where I couldn't have an overnight guest was a dorm, and there was a very strong structure of supervision in that dorm. And of course, we disobeyed the rules, and uh, you either snuck somebody into your dorm room or you went outside and stayed un in nature. So I th to discuss that with uh, Laura, and um, there's a possibility that, uh, obviously you don't want two people living in such small spaces, 240 square feet, but that, um, perhaps limited overnight stays. Because the workforce housing, they would be under the same rule. And they can move, right now they would be very excited about these apartments because they are cheaper than many of the alternatives that are available. But do you think people are really gonna stay in an apartment where they can't even have somebody overnight or have their sister spend the evening? Um, I, I think that's a problem. So that isn't even settled. We have been told that there will be uh, 20 hours of property management and 20 hours of a resident service coordinator. Only today did it become clarified that the property management person does not include the maintenance staff, that it would be somebody in an office available to talk to the tenants. That's a good thing. Um, then the question of what hours. I, I have been hoping, and I'm not really saying overnight anymore, I had just been hoping for a regular 25, 35, 40 hour week from a resident service coordinator. Now, why would you need that? Um, many of the tenants um, have different problems, different paths, and have a variety of service uh, agencies that they work with, but somebody has to know what their plan is and to, ha to have some idea, are they following through? Um, we discuss people in recovery. Um, I have spent a good deal of time this summer teaching people successfully uh, some of whom successfully in recovery. And it's a long road, it's a difficult road, and it takes a clear plan, and it takes um, concentration for the person and the people around them to make sure that success is possible. So I, I think we've come some distance, um, but the original moment that people raised questions there was <clears throat> shaming and guilt. How can you question this? Oh, you must be against affordable housing. You must hate homeless people. Well, that's not true for me, and I don't think it's true for the residents. But there was a great, there is a great desire that if this is going to go through, and it looks like there's a strong chance that it will, that it be a success. A success both for the people living in it, the workforce people, that they have a quiet, orderly place to relax and sleep after a hard day's work at a rent that they can afford. And for the residents, some of whom are coming, that are coming from homelessness, some of whom may have had substance abuse problems. But to be told that it's independent living without enough supports, I think is really a nightmare, not a dream. And so I really recommend that we postpone the vote tonight until um, Laura said that there was studying and issues that they're looking at and certain financial things they have to know. Okay, to me it seems like we've been doing this a long, long time. Um, but I think it'll continue longer. I think let's wait and see until they can firm up their plans and come with us, come to us with a good plan. 
are, are the latest letters that have come in support from a wide variety of people have said this should be a good project if properly managed, if there's proper supervision. And I think that's what we need to know more about before we can vote yes. Are there other comments? Alyssa? So I'm presuming that that was not an informal recommendation to postpone, but rather invoking the right to postpone in the charter, which would be an incredibly unwise move to make at this point, given all the people who have come to talk to us. If you want to decide at the end of our deliberation that you want to postpone a vote, I think that would be a perfectly reasonable thing to do. But you have now just shut down all discussion of this measure by invoking the right to postpone. And there's no way of us taking that back. The only person who can take that back is you. And I just don't know why we would do that to all the people who are trying to participate here. Well, I certainly do not want to postpone discussion. That's what I'm interested in, is discussion. And that's what I've been asking for, is discussion. So if I have to say, I rescind my request to postpone the vote, you know, I'm not really into this formality stuff. I want to talk about it. I want answers. I don't really want to play legal games. Okay. Steve. Yeah, so I was just going to ask a point of order that this is council comments. To me, that would sound like a motion, which would be more appropriate. She has rescinded the okay, motion. she's rescinded. Okay. So I also need to point out, I mean, I, um, plus one to what Alyssa said, but it's been de facto postponed already. So all the other CPA proposals were heard two weeks ago. And so we as a council, or really you as our president, decided that this should be postponed to today so that we could get more information, that we could have this public meeting that happened a week ago. So I feel it already has, I mean, I, I get what the section two point, whatever it is, says about the right to postpone, but I feel that we've already done much of what you've asked, what Councillor Pam has asked for. Okay. Are there other comments from the council? Kathy. I, I had a chance to talk on the finance. I was going to talk on non-finance issues, so I don't know whether Pat wants to jump in before me. Um, Pat? I was just going to make a, a, a comment um, in that I, when I went to um, the King Street property to, to look at uh, an SRO that Valley CDC uh, had created, one of the things um, that I uh, got to do was to meet with the man who manages um, Northamp the Northampton area and Amherst area. He knew tenants by name. He knew tenants by habits. He knew which tenant to go talk to because the person could um, address their envelope, but for whatever reason couldn't put it in the mailbox. And that seems like an odd little thing, but to me it really opened my heart that this young man had such an awareness of the tenants in the building, um, and not just that building, that he could converse about them, that he could make decisions on how to support them. And his position is man property management, not service coordinator. Um, I think there has been a lot of misstatement by counselors, by public, all in all directions, in all directions. Um, and I think that we need to move forward with this however the vote comes out, and to delay any further would be ridiculous. Are there other comments? Kathy. Um, yes, I knew because I was on the finance committee that we would focus just on the finance issues. I did ask a wider range of questions, and I decided both to visit the homeless shelter here operated in Amherst, and then we were given tours of two small studio apartments that are operated by Valley CDC by the general property manager, but we met people who live there, we met neighbors, and what you instantly feel when you're visiting places is these are adults living independently, and one of them, um, they were actually um, starting to gather to share some pizza and other food together that one had gone out and they invited us in to have a bite with them. Um, and we went downstairs to the cafe that's in the lower part of their building and she talked about how wonderful it was to have the group upstairs and one of the things they have is uh, in this speckled uh, fox cafe is they have a little voucher you can 
by yourself. You contribute another cup of coffee and it goes up on a chit so someone can come in and drink a free cup of coffee and the people upstairs contribute free cups of coffee so other people can drink a cup of coffee. But it, it had a very community feeling to it and the design of it felt like a community as well as the outdoor gardens. Um, so we've gotten some letters of support by neighbors and downstairs people, but it was a good thing to see because I had asked about in uh, direct support as well as property management support. And so we had a long discussion on the other memorandums of understanding where, um, and I, I have a healthcare and welfare background that uh, if you're getting help with food stamps, you're getting help with health care, you're getting help with housing, you have to reapply every year for all of these. So one of the things you've got with uh, groups is experts who know how to do a, each of those working because not everyone living is going to need each of those pieces so they're augmented by these external services as well as the person that Pat was talking about or helping you manage a budget or you can't get your phone bill straightened out. So it was a good thing to be actual seeing it in action and these are small spaces um, and actually the bit proposal here would build a larger space than what I saw. Um, but n very nicely and beautifully laid out. These are beautiful buildings, is the other thing I might add. Other comments? Uh, Evan. So I want to speak uh, just a bit to Dorsey's concern about uh, the process and the length of time that this has been discussed. So I, ser I first learned about uh, this project, the specific project, uh, from the Gazette's article on it on January 16th. Um, on January 24th, I attended the CDBG hearing on this project, uh, which was the first time that I heard from neighbors and abutters of the project, some of whom are here today, voicing their concerns. So starting on January 24th is when I first started hearing concerns from the neighbors and saw them have the opportunity to start asking questions, including questions directly of Valley CDC. The meeting for the broader neighbors, so not just the abutters, but broader community, was April 24th. That's now over two months ago. Since then, this has been a persistent conversation topic for the council. It has dominated several meetings, uh, including lengthy public comments in the Finance Committee meeting that discussed CPAC, the budget hearing, which I believe was May 29th, I believe the budget hearing was, uh, which became a de facto discussion about this project. We had a four-hour meeting a week ago about this project that included two hour, over two hours of public comment that, that in many ways represented the dialogue that we've been asked, that, that, that people, we've been asked of. Um, I, I find it incredible that anyone would say that this has been rushed that people have not had time to air their concerns or ask their questions, because I've been hearing about this since January. I've seen Valley CDC, which is a fairly small nonprofit that has also been in the process of opening up another property and moving, so they are not uh, saddled with abundant free time, um, very intensely respond to questions, answer questions. I know I was at the Finance Committee last week when Kathy referenced that uh, Laura Baker's response to her questions were incredibly thorough, um, which she expected, uh, it exceeded what she expected. So any contention that questions haven't been answered, that we haven't discussed this fully, um, I, I think is, is frankly absurd because we've been talking about this fully. It's been consuming more time than any other singular issue, and there has been no issue in front of this, granted this council still in its infancy, but there's been no single issue in front of this council that has been more thoroughly vetted debated, discussed uh, by the full council than this issue. Are there other comments from the council? George. First of all, I wanted to express my gratitude to our president who has worked extremely hard. And if, if we spent 10 hours or more, she spent three or four times that time in making sure that information be accessible to all of you um, as soon as possible, often working under intense time pressure. So I, I'm very grateful for that and for her leadership. I'm also grateful for the work of the Finance Committee, whom uh, once again has provided us with a very thorough and thoughtful report. Um, I think the issue that lies before us this evening, and I've felt this way for quite some time, 
really focuses on the question, two questions really, is this an appropriate use of CPA monies? And secondly, would this borrowing in any way lessen the town's ability to borrow given the impending capital projects that are coming up, or would it seriously limit or hinder the CPA from doing its business? If I were to find out that either of these things were true, I would not vote for this under any circumstances. But I think that has been answered fairly clearly in the finance report, and I encourage people to read it with care. Um, this is an appropriate use of CPA monies, if there ever was one. And secondly, it's been made very clear that this will not uh, affect or uh, hinder in any way uh, the town's ability to bond uh, for the capital projects upcoming, nor will it affect or hinder the CPA committee from doing its work over the next couple of years. So I think that issue has been addressed. As to the matter of location, size of building, number of units, parking, management plan, impact on neighborhood, public safety, et cetera, et cetera, all good questions and appropriately have been asked. I think they have been answered to a large degree, but these are matters for the ZBA. There is a robust and very public process with ample opportunity for community input, both pro and con, to address these issues. I don't think this body possesses either the experience or the training or the expertise to decide matters involving zoning. That's why we have a ZPA, and that's why they are advised in these matters by a very professional planning department, and that's why they follow very strict and careful guidelines in making these sorts of determinations. We would, in essence, it seems to me, be substituting our ill-informed opinions and judgments in matters that are carefully delimited by law and subject to legal challenge and potential lawsuit. I don't think this body would like to be in that situation. We have a robust and open process, and I think we should follow it. Additional comments? Mandy Jo. So um, this has been an interesting issue for me to think about because until about 10 months ago, I lived approximately 400 feet away from the property. Um, and I no longer do um, because of the landlord's rules on where I was living. Um, so I was, had to move within two years of a certain incident, but um, a certain happy incident. But <laughs> so I lived in the neighborhood for seven years. And so I feel like I know it fairly well. Um, and that is why it's been a tough issue for me to think about because I've heard some things about the neighborhood um, that I don't necessarily agree with. At the same time, some of the items that have been brought up by individuals um, I absolutely do think are legitimate concerns, and, and, and I'll mention them in a minute. But our role at the town council is to figure out whether this project should be funded, um, not the specifics of exactly what the project needs to look like in terms of its permitting. Um, this project, if you look at our master plan, ticks a whole number and a whole lot of boxes for what our master plan is seeking in housing, not just affordable housing, but housing in general. Um, it is a mixed income project in and of itself. Um, it is a project that where it is cited will um, bring diversity to the neighborhood in which it is being cited for both um, housing type, um, but also um, avoiding enclaves of poverty or wealth, um, which is objective H1 in our master plan. Um, it is located in downtown, close to services. At the same time, it is easily walkable to a large grocery store. I've walked both directions from that neighborhood on a regular basis. Um, and they're all affordable, including some units that would provide housing for special populations. Also an item, both, both that, the homeless and the um, Department of Mental Health ones that are called out in our master plan. The relative amount of money that Valley CDC is seeking from Amherst and the CPA grant um, as it relates to the number of units is within the goals of our affordable housing trust in terms of cost per unit for the town. Um, and our town has a large commitment to affordable housing. 
uh, now to the concerns that I have. Um, since I lived in the neighborhood, I recognize that if built at the size it is being proposed, it's a large building for the neighborhood. Um, there's, it's hard to say it's not. Um, it is, it may be out of scale, it may not be, um, but it is large for that neighborhood. And there are some concerns about the service plan, but um, in, including that they may not, that the current as proposed may not be adequate to serve some of the residents that may end up living there, mainly a portion of those that are coming out of homelessness. But both of these concerns, in my opinion, are more properly addressed, as George said, at the permitting stage. And I have to put my trust in the fellow residents that this council just appointed to the permit granting bodies that they'll thoroughly consider the project and these concerns. Um, and given that, um, I think we need to make a decision not just on um, whether there's concerns that could be addressed later on, but what the good of the town, what is the good for the town? I, I was elected as an at-large counselor, so, so that's where my, my thing says. But we've heard arguments about the property taxes won't pay for the cost that the town would be doing, but you know what? We as a council don't analyze projects on only is there a good return on investment, including money? If, there, if that's how we anal analyzed projects, we'd never build single family homes intended for students to live in because the cost of educating a student in, every, in any one year out, out costs the amount of property taxes collected from any one resident, residence. Um, and then another argument that was made is that it won't make a significant dent in the homeless population. If we were to only fund projects that were gonna make a significant dent, we wouldn't fund projects because it would be really hard to make a significant dent in our affordable housing needs in this town in just one project. That said, I will point out that this project would provide 28 units and our housing production plan aims to add 50 units per year. 28 of 50 is a good 64% um, of an annual goal, so that is actually a significant dent in our housing pr production plan for a year. Um, so I think we should be voting, and I think we should be voting yes, because the CPA funds are appropriate and it's a good value for the community as a whole. Additional comments? Andy. So I'm going to take a slightly different, but still consistent um, position of my uh, most of the people who've spoken. Just say that uh, as former member of the select board, former member of town meeting, that I've looked at um, these kinds of processes for quite a number of years, and uh, I don't recall ever having been put in a position of of, of voting that we've actually voted on a um, proposal like this at this stage of the process where we're voting on the CPA. Um, the closest probably was the Plum Brook um, development, but um, that's been quite some time and was overturned by the voters in the end. Um, and the voters made the, or at least the voters made the final decision to go forward. But I think that the major thing that strikes me from the experiences that I've looked at is that there have been numbers of times when we've had relied on the uh, permit granting bodies, the ZBA and the planning board. And every one of those times, I think that they have really done excellent job for the community. Um, I look at what happened with the Beacon uh, proposal in North Amherst for North Square, and uh, they had um, an extremely robust process. Um, they ended up granting the permit, but with 130 conditions. Um, it was not lightly done. Um, I've looked at what they've been doing with some of the proposals to, um, 
for marijuana dispensary facilities. And it's not just been an automatic lock. They have looked at each one very carefully and made sure that um, they were putting on the kinds of conditions that were appropriate uh, for the business to be, that was being proposed to be run in a responsible manner and um, that were location specific and appropriate for the location. And uh, I look at what the planning board has done with um, many projects, including um, the retreat, which was the one that uh, ended up not end being built after the planning board process. But it was an extremely thoughtful and thorough planning board process that went forward. Uh, so I look forward um, if we, uh, regardless of how this goes, to um, having the Zoning Board of Appeals, assuming that that is going to be the body that hears this, to have the opportunity to do what I think our permit granting bodies have always done, and I think have done extremely well to the benefit of this community. Additional comments? Pat. Um, this has been a difficult process for me um, in many ways, but there's been something very powerful for me uh, embedded in it, and that's the attendance uh, here and at other meetings of people both opposed and people who were for the pro um, project. I think that we need to find ways to talk across difference. and. Uh, I felt there were real attempts on the walk particularly to talk to me as a mother, as a counselor, as a woman, um, as a resident of Amherst, uh, and to share concerns. Um, it was a learning process for me, and I value the relationships I've started to make with some people, uh, both again, for and against. Um, so while it has been an incredibly difficult process um, for everyone, uh, I think we need to move forward and move forward, finding ways to move forward together. And I think it's, I do think that's possible. Additional comments? Uh, let me make a couple comments of my own. So I kept wondering, well, what can we do as a council? Not unlike what Dorothy's been asking before we pass this on to the next phase. Could we put conditions on our vote? And I explored that and found out we can't. We either vote this or we don't vote it. But I want to point out that this is a legislative process and this is a record. Tonight is a record. Our minutes form a record, our video forms a record. So even if there are issues that we still feel unsettled about, they're on the record and we've stated what those conditions and situations are, whether it's because it's too big or whether it's because it doesn't have enough support services. In the end, I'm very supportive of this and I hope that we as a town We'll put our money where our mouth is and go forward. Are there other comments before we go to public comment? Okay, um, public comment. This is three minutes and I would prefer that to the extent we become repetitive, we just keep moving on, okay? Please, absolutely. It's hard to talk and sign at the same time. Um, Lisa Campbell, Pine Grove, representing the League of Women Voters of Amherst, which supports this project. And basically because the League has for a long time supported having housing for as many different kinds of people and income levels as possible. And this is an example of an attempt to do that. 
I have been paying attention in the last several weeks to additional information that's come out about the costs of housing in the country and versus incomes in the country, also in the state. I don't have specific numbers for Amherst, but in the state with a minimum wage currently of $12 an hour, the fair market rent for a one bedroom apartment is $1,425 a month. Someone making $12 an hour would have to work 91 hours a week to pay for that at fair market rent. For a studio, the fair market rent is $1,272. That tenant would need to earn $24.46 an hour to pay for a studio apartment at fair market rent in Massachusetts, meaning 30% of their income. And we have a minimum wage of $12 an hour. I think most of us are aware that the cost of housing has gone up a lot. And recently it's gone up even more. The basic reason is because we haven't built enough. Throughout the country, and specifically here as well. Last year I read a book called Dream Hoarders about the way that zoning and rules and regulations and building codes have been probably not intentionally but nonetheless have had the effect of raising the drawbridge that those of us who have a place to live, who already own a place, may be doing just fine but people who need a place, who are younger or got into the housing market later for whatever reason, often don't. So I think it's really urgent that we do what we can in this town. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Additional comments? I'd like to call on people who've not commented yet this evening, if I could. Yeah, please. Okay, I'm Barbara Graven Wilbur. I am an immediate butter. Um, I want to state for the record that I have never been against affordable housing. I have spent some time, perhaps not as much as you all have, but some time on this, and it's been a real learning experience. Um, affordable housing is an issue. I have some concerns about the size. I won't go into that because it's repetitive. I also have concerns that looking at data that I saw, and it wasn't extensive, is single, housing for singles, has, for homeless singles, has remained pretty steady since 2007 through uh, 2018, whereas family housing has more than doubled. The need for homeless families has more than doubled. I would like to urge the town, when they're considering affordable housing, that they do a couple things. One, that they start focusing on families as well. If you're single and you need a place, is it not easier to find another single that perhaps you guys can go together, or three or four, and get together? Maybe not ideal, but it's certainly a lot easier as a single than it is for a family. Secondly, I think that what um, Alyssa just said about uh, housing, the town needs to be better about enforcing um, quotas on developers that they do build affordable housing and not the big mansions. The same is true with renters, either um, independents who are renting their home out, that they take in more low income or create affordable housing. Um, and I look forward to learning more about zoning and being quite active in the zoning board. Thanks very much. You guys have done well beyond, and I do appreciate it. Thank you for your comments. Additional comments over here. Um, yes, please, you may come forward, but you do not bring your signs forward. Oh, it's my notes. Okay, that's different. There was a sign on the other side. Okay, I'm gonna do my best. Please sit down, state Wave. your name. I totally support it. My voucher runs out in four days, and my choice was between a place that has a lot of people that you wanna put in diverse housing, and I chose it was better in my car. So quickly, at the Rainbow Gathering, they actually separate 
They do a segregation. I'm into diversity, but I'm not into segregating problematic people with. They have an A camp, and so the people who need high maintenance are not with the other people because the people who don't have problems deserve a proper normal right to their property and use of enjoyment. Um, I wish that the information was not a download. I could never get it. But um, I don't like the lumping of homeless. I am homeless, but I am not low life. And there was no way I was going to live at the one apartment complex that has become a place where people are not independent. So I really wish people would lump character and lifestyle because they really, you can't not homeless. I, I do think that there should be some incentive, which is maybe that people should have to be in some program before they get in. I've been on the streets for a year, and I'm, you know, there are a lot of people, they, they're not wanting help, and I really, okay, I better read because there's time. Okay, both housing and house can have negative or positive impact, and yes, one person could totally impact not one complex, but two complexes, and they're not even someone who's technically needs a babysitter. Um, I think that the police calls, I think there's problems that should be addressed before people pre-think new problems, which are police calls and visits from a PD indicates such areas. I think that money, can, that those places should be fined or have some sort of reward program for not having calls. Um, I don't think on-site patrol, I am in my situation because I was a victim from both white collar crime and blue collar. The last thing I want to do is be treated like an inmate or also be left to deal with the people that everyone is so nicely wanting to embrace. I don't know why they have to go together. Okay, incentives and repercussions, you know, good behavior rewarded. I think that saving them count money by actually not enabling so much blatant alcohol use. Like, you know what, if you want to get a place, you have to at least tr care enough to try. I'm distressed to hear that marijuana would not be legal, but drugs and alcohol are. Um, I have four days for my voucher. I'm in North Square a lot are really close, but I probably won't be able to find out in time before my voucher. I was offered a sight unseen Valley Development Corporation thing, which is not suited because I'm chemically sensitive and upstairs and no air is not going to work. However, I'm starting to wonder, is this going to be an apartment where I'm going to have extremely troubled neighbors again, meaning that I will not be allowed proper normal use of enjoyment? Okay, overnight guests, yes. Nothing like more like being treated like an inmate or if that you can't have a guest. Hello. Yes, people blow that and they have permanent roommates, but that can be looked at like any property management sh should. Um, okay, okay, five months. It should have taken me five months to get a place. Broker fee is really what is one of the main things people need of a path to homelessness. Please. If you don't have the broker fee, and so to that end, I think some of the organizations should be a little better looked at that supposedly help the homeless because they feel they're doing a very inefficient job and perhaps hindering. And Thank I you. really want the project to work, and I have faith in all you good people that it will. Thank you for your comments. Who else would like to speak? Come forward. John Page, 683 East Pleasant Street. I grew up in affordable housing, so I was glad to see that we actually got to hear from people's experiences who live in affordable housing at the 24th meeting. Their voice is often lost in the conversation. I would also like to make a bold statement that Amherst needs the people that need affordable housing. From school teachers, as somebody referenced, to firefighters, seniors, people with disabilities, working young professionals trying to get their start. If we're gonna to continue to be a dynamic and diverse community, that is economically viable, and that welcomes people of all walks of life, addressing the housing affordability crisis in our community must be a top priority of this body, and this project is one piece of that puzzle. I am proud of the outpouring support from community members and social service organizations that this project has received and hope that the council takes this important step to addressing just one piece of this critical housing need in our community. We will still have a long, long, long zoning process to go, but I look forward to the prospect of welcoming 28 individuals, maybe 28, into Amherst, whoever they are, to a place where they can now call home, where they can enjoy our active downtown and maybe even stroll through Pratt Field. I hope the community invites them to their neighborhood brunch and cares for them as neighbors, as they do each other, as we should 
with dignity, respect, and compassion. Town Council, I implore you to delay no further to show policy leadership and unanimously approve the CPA funding for this project as recommended by the CPA Committee, the Municipal Housing Trust, the Housing Authority, lead by example, and do what is right for all families. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments at this time? This woman right here. Yes. Good evening. My name is Amy Gilbert Loinez. I live at 14 Orchard Street. Um, I do have a lot of concerns about the citizen participation process and, you know, all the way going back to the CBDG committee meeting where there was no outreach to neighbors before, before this was uh, voted on in January. There was no immediate outreach to neighbors when it calls for pursuant to a mandated citizen participation plan, input from at all the stages of planning and implementation. This may be something that I need to bring up later during the zoning board process. So as Barbara said, we look forward to, to looking at the zoning board of appeals and, and that whole process and getting familiar with that. As I was doing my research, I didn't have a chance to go so much into the consolidated plan. But right now I wanna talk more about the lack of services that have been detailed for this project. Um, I am a public health professional, and I had just learned last week that there were no resident service coordinators at any of the four sites in Northampton. And while I appreciate that the property manager knows the residents and knows them and can help them in their daily living, they are not social service experts who can deal with crises or deal with the needs of people of this very vulnerable population in transition from homelessness or dealing with mental health issues and really being able to direct them in a professional way. So I've heard about all this expertise of Valley CDC, and I will give you that they seem to be construction experts, but I ask you, where is the programming expertise? We're asking for services recommended by all the re relevant federal and state agencies, as well as true expert clinicians who work with this, the vulnerable population that is within this targeted group. Valley CDC has not been responsive to our concerns. We're asking for 24-hour care and accessibility seven days a week, which is the standard of care for high-needs populations in permanent supportive housing. Valley CDC also states that the supportive services agency that recommends tenants are responsible for their care, that these services are offered up to 12 months on average. For those receiving federal funding from HUD, HUD stipulates that tenants are to be offered services for the duration of their stay not 12 months, but for the duration of their stay. When I asked Valley CDC what would happen if those providers couldn't offer services partic the particular applicant needed, I was told that they wouldn't accept the applicant. We were all here when members of Amherst Ford lectured the town council about your obligations under the Olmstead Act. In fact, it's not town council that is at risk of being in violation of fair housing, but it's actually Valley CDC if they decide to cherry pick their vulnerable population to meet their limited services. I implore the town council to obtain a detailed service plan from Valley CDC so that it can be properly evaluated. Please wrap up. Okay. We've heard from AMHT staff that you should not worry about the details of this plan, that there are safeguards along the process in the ZBA. That's if you vote yes without understanding the service component of the project, you are saying yes without really knowing what you are saying yes to. Thank you. Additional comments at this time? Back here. So I can't identify because I'm a victim of domestic violence and I have an open case with the district attorney's office because the abuser violated a condition of a restraining order. So I can't do that right now, but I tried to talk last week and I just wanted to sort of finish up because it's important. Um, but I will show anyone my ID and give you information about the case if you need it. I'm just asking the press to respect that. Um, Smith College donated 550, this was not a loan, $1,000 to the Valley 
CDC for project development costs for the 9698 King Street Apartments in Northampton. $100,000 to the Valley CDC, CDC for an affordable property on Pleasant Street that just opened. And in 2008, gave $220,000 to subsidize the development of four new apartments at 4648 School Street, which not only abuts Smith, but a neighborhood park and green space frequented by skaters, children, animals, and families. I tried to talk about how difficult it was for me to read the critiques and the information being disseminated by some of the Amherst College professors last week. Um, it's really painful. <laughs> so I care a lot about this issue and I'm really mortified that 11 or 12 people that don't represent Biddy Martin, the chair of the board, it or please, the alumni. Please do spoken, not go personal. Well, they don't, are saying that access to Pratt Field is going to be restricted because it is sort of a, a criminality narrative and a, a doomsday prediction for a small group of potential t tenants that have not even been selected, chosen. You know nothing about who they are. They could be a, a victim of domestic violence. It could be anyone. It could be you. It could be your daughters. Um, and I'm really sick of the stereotyping. So I, do, I just, it is so painful to hear that. Amherst is not 50 people. There are thousands of people in this town that you represent. This is a minority. And what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing in the paper is abhorrent. And I urge you to pass this. These people need protection. They are not all drug addicts or alcoholics. They don't need to be infantilized. They need to be loved. Prattfield is not gonna close, period. It's fear mongering, it has to stop. I mean, we need you, they need you. It has to stop. And I'm gonna do something. I will take it out of here and I will go to Biddy Martin's office. This is ridiculous. The dean of faculty needs to be involved. UMass would never do this. Please. Never. Thank you. Thank you. In the, all the way in the back, the gentleman here. Excuse me. I'm Nate Buddington. I'm uh, live in North Amherst, and I'm uh, chair of the CPA committee. And um, I sort of want to take off on what the, what the last speaker just said. Um, I think in this debate that that we've been in the middle of, there's this belief that a lack of in-house supervision immediately invites trouble. And I think we need to be clear that this isn't a halfway house, and it's not a mental health facility. It's housing for low-income people, some of whom are struggling in ways other than financial, but not everybody. And the prospective residents or clients are pretty thoroughly vetted to present those, to prevent those living in this space who may be violent or disruptive or otherwise criminal. And I think like other successful Valley CDC SROs, this facility is designed as a complement to the neighborhood and not as a distraction. And I think they've been pretty clear about that. To get to what the previous speaker said, floating around this discussion and this demand for, um, or this request for 24-7 staffing is the idea that low-income people left to their own devices revert to a kind of default set of behaviors um, that degrades the neighborhood. And I don't think there's any evidence to show that that's the case. These are predominantly people who are low-income, who are struggling who are single, who may have some mental health problems, who may be veterans, um, who may be victims of domestic violence, who may be transitioning out of homeless, homelessness. Um, they just need a place to stay. They need a place to make a meal and to be housed. And, I, I, you know, the, there's, there's zero evidence that bad behavior comes from low-income people living together based on the experience that Valley CDC's programs in Northampton um, they don't generate, they haven't generated any neighborhood demand for in-house supervision, and there's been no significant demand for it since those projects opened. These projects work. So 
I, I mean, you could say, we'll approve this project, um, but we need, we're, we're gonna ask that you provide 24 seven in-house supervision. But I, I remember at the open forum, the chief of police was asked, um, you know, what do you think of these kind of projects? And his response was, if they're well managed, I'm okay with it. And, I, you know, I think in, in Valley CDC, we have about the best, most experienced, most invested management possible. I mean, it just doesn't get any better than Valley CDC from what I've seen. Um, Mike Giles, who's a neighbor of this project at the Open Forum, warned us that, um, you know, you could easily kill this project by delaying it for, quote, further study, unquote. And I don't think this needs further study. This isn't a pilot program. It's not an experiment. It's been Please done up. multiple times in Northampton, and it works. I hope you'll see this project for what it is, well-located, appropriately scaled, exceptionally well-managed, desperately needed. Um, I urge you to approve this project as proposed without delay. Thank you Thank for you. your comments. Gentleman way back, yes. I'll be very brief. I'm Peter Jessup, and until recently, I was a long-term resident of Amherst and for a member of the Community Preservation Act Committee for 10 years, and I think I chaired it uh, for six or seven, way too long, um, more than I probably should have. I just want to uh, say thanks to Nate for his comments. I, I'm not even going to talk about that, but I do want to support Mr. Ryan's comments, Mr. Steinberg's comments, that the focus, I think, of the council, it's interesting because all the work I did with CPA was before town meeting, and I supported the charter completely. I'm glad to see you here. I'm glad to see you performing these roles. I get how it's a little different from town meeting, though. I get how you might think this is the place where you can or need to intervene. And I, I actually agree with Mr. Ryan. I think the questions before you are, should you support this CPA appropriation as a beginning step towards moving this project forward? And I think the answer to that is yes. I think that's your responsibility. I think that's your obligation. And, I'm, and I hope you do do that. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments? Yes. Again, uh, Vince O'Connor, um, Summer Street, and I am a low-income tenant, and I have been for the 45 years I've lived in town. Um, and so what I would caution the council, even though your decision is really about the money, not to buy into the assurances that you've been given about the Zoning Board of Appeals. As a tenant, I made a number of suggestions regarding the North Square project. In that project, the Zoning Board of Appeals granted 134 exceptions to the zoning bylaw and did not take into account any concern for the tenants who were going to live there, the family tenants, because 104 of those 130 units are going to be student housing. So, and I, I attended and provided written testimony about the, some of the five-story buildings at 1 East Pleasant Street. Um, and in that process, um, I listened to the proponents allege that all those tents were going to be new age people who didn't drive automobiles. And that, um, and that every bedroom would only have one resident, even though the one bedroom apartments were priced at $1,800 to $2,000. And the two bedrooms at $2,300 to $2,500. Believe me, I think you, you may have um, one, I think it is a mistake to demonize neighbors who have concerns because some of those concerns are legitimate. I spent a lot of time in Cushman, where Mr. Steinberg lives, addressing those issues by knocking on the doors of almost all the homeowners in that, that place eight or ten times as a member of the building committee for the housing authority for their duplex programs. The neighbors have legitimate concerns. They need to be listened to. They don't need to be turned over to a board who is simply going to demonize them, ignore them, ram the project through, and, and do it. Because I will just say, the only project of this nature 
where significant changes were made to the project was at Long Meadow Drive, and that re resulted from 10 years of litigation and appeals. If you don't want that process to go on, I strongly recommend that you not demonize the neighbors, that you listen to what they say, and that you make absolutely certain in whatever way you can that, the, that whoever hears this, whether it's the Planning Board or Zoning Board of Appeals, takes their concerns seriously and has, renders balanced judgment, not the judgment that I have been seeing for the last 10 or 15 years out of both the Planning Board and Zoning Board. Are there additional comments at this time? Please come forward. Meg Gage, District 1. I'm going to be super brief. This is definitely not one of the issues that the public hasn't heard about. <laughs> so that's good to note. I want to make, uh, I'm strongly in favor of this project. I am not going to repeat uh, the arguments that have been made before, but I want to make three very quick points that I don't think have been made. Uh, this, I live around the corner from the Survival Center, and people in our neighborhood had initially some anxiety about that, and nothing has, there have been no problems at all, and it's been only a, a, a source of pride and uh, a highly functioning, and it's a wonderful experience to live near the Survival Center. It's very heartening for me to see the very broad political support behind this, uh, and it's one of the most hopeful things about it, that people on all sides of previous debates are agreeing on this, and um, I think it's important to have reconciliation and people try efforts to get together, but the best way to have people get together across a broad political spectrum is to, to work on policy together. Um, and also, I just want to remind people that we have had a, a very successful small studio apartment project in the downtown, which was the Drake. And I made, I had printed for you to look at this iconic, uh, this is now art, picture that's on, a uh, graffiti that's on the side of the Amherst Cinema. Uh, because this was a huge battle many decades ago to save the Drake for Willie and humanity. Uh, this uh, studio, small studio apartments, was in the middle, of, right in downtown, very near Lincoln Avenue, very near um, high-end homes on North Prospect Street. When we, uh, the board, I was, the Amherst Cinema, the, when I was the, chair of the board partnered with Barry Roberts. One of the big feedback that we got from everybody was to save this art. Although that's, anyway, I think it's just good to remember we've had this before and it was very successful. Thank you. Are there other comments at this time? Please come forward. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Tim Adderidge, and I live at 143 Northampton Road. And <clears throat> I've heard a lot of comments uh, that I really liked coming from the, the town council, uh, a couple that I wasn't pleased with, but you know, that's the way it goes. Uh, the comment that Councillor Steinberg said that uh, the Finance Committee looked at this, and this was a sound business proposition. Uh, although I have agreed with him on many of occasion uh, at town meeting, uh, I have to disagree on this one. Uh, who would get into business with someone who buys a piece of property for $407,000 and doesn't have a plan for it? They'd, at the time of purchase, they did not have a financial plan. They've approached the CPAC for $500,000, for the CBDG for $250,000, and they've already received $53,000 from the town to do the study. Uh, I question the validity of getting into a business partnership with someone who operates like that. Now, one of the previous speakers said that uh, C VCDC got I can't remember the totals, but a lot of money from Smith College. Uh, now, I've often wondered how VCDC 
can run a successful business as a nonprofit, and now I can understand it that they're getting money from a lot of different places. And as a matter of fact, I f think that when you, if you approve this, that will trigger them being able to receive other monies from either federal or state organizations. My point being, however, is that I, I doubt uh, if I doubt if they're so forthcoming with their business dealings. And if in the future, is the town of Amherst going to be on the hook for costs that may be at that time considered unintended consequences? So I uh, ask the town council to think seriously about approving the CPAC funds. Now, someone said earlier that you know, there was a question about the, this is the appropriate use of the money. It is the appropriate use of the money, no doubt about it. There's only so many categories you can use that money for, and this is one of them. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure that my uh, thoughts on this are on the record. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Are there additional comments at this time? Okay, then I'm going to move back to the council. We have a motion, um, which I would read, and it is based on the item up there. And the motion um, that I need someone to make is to adopt appropriation and transfer order FY 20-10 an order appropriating CPA funds as a grant for Valley Community Development Corporation Amherst Studio Apartments as recommended by the Finance Committee and shown on page seven of the document entitled Town Council Finance Committee Recommendation on Community Preservation Act Proposal. Do I hear a motion? So moved. A second. second. Okay, any further comments at this time? This is a roll call vote, Reco requires nine votes. Um, Athena? Councillor Brewer? Aye. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. Councillor Dumont? Yes. Councillor Grusmer? Yes. Councillor Haneke? Yes. Councillor Pam? Abstain. Councillor Ross? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Shane? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Councillor Swartz? Aye. We have 10, <laughs> ten with one abstention. So the vote is 11 4, one abstain, no, no against, one abstain, and one absent. I'm sorry, 11 0 1. Thank you. We're going to take a break at this time. Thank you. We'd like to continue our meeting. We're going to reconvene. Okay, um, we're going to reconvene. Certainly know how to clear a room. <laughs> I 
I said, I certainly know how to clear a room. <laughs> okay. Um, we are reconvening, and I just want to mention that Amherst Media actually was able to connect back up, but unfortunately only partway through the public comment. So we will be figuring out with them how to mesh the two sets of So, so are we back live? No. <laughs> we're not going over it again. Oh. I, I promise you. No, I just want to know if we're back live now. We're back live. <laughs> yeah. We are back live. No, not, not rerun. <laughs> I already, replay, replay. I already have to have two adjournments. Okay. Uh, we are moving on to item C, 7C. It's to establish a process for candidates to publish statements regarding their candidacy on the town bulletin board. And let me just state, this is a requirement of the charter that under section 7.6, uh, publication of candidate statements, that the town council shall establish a process compliant with state campaign and political financial laws for candidates who names, whose name will appear on the election ballot to publish statements regarding their candidacy on the town bulletin board. And given this, um, rather than us sit here and discuss, well, what do we think that means and um, how are we going to go about it, um, while we are more than glad to hear public comment and the council will discuss it, the motion tonight is to refer this to GOL to put some meat on the bones and come back with us. I will, ha will say that it's important that we do this since we do have a fall election coming up. So, uh, council comments at this time. Alyssa. So I had a couple of quick ones uh, associated with just the way we word the motion when it eventually gets made, just to make it clear that we're not referring a process, we're referring an idea, um, just as we did with a couple of the others. And you know, this is all words thing that we're so I totally understand. But, and I'd also like to make sure we, we reference Charter Section 7.6 in it, just to show that, yeah, we're, we're doing a thing that we're required to do, rather than just, we just thought we wanted more work. But, the and of course, then my concern is that the other, so, Wordsmith a little, mentioned the Charter, uh, and I, I'm trying not to laugh hysterically at the idea of this being done by July 22nd because this is going to require actual count attorney look at this this is going to require ethics people to talk to the attorney etc this is why we don't do it already is because it's complicated and so i i appreciate that fall would be awesome but i don't think two weeks is going to work additional comments yes dorothy just to say i think it's a good idea okay i'm sorry it's a good idea Darcy. Uh, just uh, wondering if the process is going to end up being in our rules. Is that the ultimate goal? The rules of procedure? Yes. Hmm. Or, I guess my question is, where is this process going to end up? Um, good question, in Mandy Jo. So um, I'll try to answer it as potentially that, well, I am the chair of GOL, but um, I don't think it would be appropriate for the rules since the process would apply not just to town council elections, but all municipal elections. Um, and the rules, our rules only apply to us as councilors. Um, potentially it would look similar to what um, GOL put forth to the council and the council adopted for the public ways policy, just a sheet of paper and then you would adopt it could look like just adopting a policy or whatever the charter wording is, a process for having candidate statements on that's just a separate document is one possibility. I'm sure GOL could come up with a few others, but that would be what I would think it might look like. So, so where would such a policy reside if anyone were looking for it? GOL, GOL could make a recommendation as to where on the town's website, that policy could reside. GOL also currently has under its referral to discuss where all town adopted policies will reside on the website, so. The, the charter reads, it's to establish a process. 
And but but I and it when it says compliant with state campaign and political financial laws, it really is a matter of what what are we willing to put up? What do we think we legally can put up? And what can we not put up? Okay. Are there other comments? Yes, Kathy. Um, w one thought, and I like referring it to GOL to develop how would this work, is when we were running, so I'm assuming it'll happen again, there was an elections page, you know, so there was a place you could go to how to file where you got information. So if we made it very prominent, you know, on, on it's not clear where you would go right now. I'm on the town website. Would you go to government, for example? But under government, there could be something saying elections and candidate statements. Um, so my thought on this, I think it's a great idea. And there was no place to go last time. So I also, if I would hope that GOL will come back with a little bit of guidance on what can be the content of that. So not just I'm running and I'm a great person, but you know, the issues, few issues I'm running on and a bit about me, so a little bit about background of each, so we get a fairly standardized form with a section on each with some suggestions. You write something there so people can go across and look at people instead of getting some person does a paragraph and someone does two pages. <laughs> okay. Any additional comments from the council? Yes, Andy. Yeah, I, I uh, going to vote in favor because I really look forward to the study that the committee will give to it. It may be that um, the town website, in fact, is not the best place for this to be, and it may be that um, organization like, and I'll just pull it out of the air, the League of Women Voters might be a more appropriate website because they um, are, have as their role informing voters. Uh, and uh, uh, there may be um, less of the legal issues that the GOL might discover, but um, without doing the study, we're not going to find out. Uh, Dorothy. Well, of course I thought of the league, but, um, and the, you would have to then do a link, but I think I would like it on the town website, and then I hope that when sometime in the future, we agree that um, we'll have, you know, videos or websites on the town page that we would be in a process. Obviously, this is going to take a long time to work out, but I think that's, we talked about uh, making a more level playing field. I think that's one way to do it, so that a candidate would know, okay, I can put a statement, I can have a, a video, I can have um, um, other things, I, a, maybe a brief website on the town, the town website. Or links to. Okay. Uh, additional comments? Yes, Andy. Yeah, just to follow up on that, I mean, we are back to the OCPF question, the Office of Campaign and Political Finance, as to whether the town can use any town resources for political purposes. I think that the rules, as I understand them, are fairly clear on the subject, um, and uh, I look forward to the committee's thorough study of those rules and making sure that we only go forward with something if it meets those tests. Evan. So I want to echo uh, what Alyssa said. I'm, I'm mostly concerned about the July 22nd date. Um, I just heard from Andy and Kathy the words thorough study. Um, and right now, GOL has one meeting scheduled between now and the 22nd. Um, also, I am gone for a week in July, and then our, our chair is also um, on another continent. <laughs> um, so I, we're, we have some limited flex, we're limited in our ability to schedule additional meetings. Um, it, depending on how thorough you want us to look at this, uh, July 22nd might not be reasonable. Of course, the question then becomes, uh, are the next meeting is very likely August 19th. Um, we have people who are pulling papers now. Um, what I think the date by the date that we choose needs to both be reasonable for GOL, but also needs to keep in mind, uh, given that people have already started pulling papers, when would we want to see these these uh, profiles or whatever go up? Because that might also dictate when we want when we look something. 
so, uh, Alyssa, I hope you're working on crafting the motion. And second of all, uh, let me just say, all that would be expected on July 29th is just an update. It's If you expect to come in with a fully cooked process, good luck. Uh, the second thing is that I also urge the committee to stage that maybe there's a minimum amount we can do for this election, but then there's more we can do by the next election. So that it's not like we have to come up with a full and complete process at once, just to think about it that way. Are there other comments? Yes, Mandy Jo. I just wanted to see if we knew what date papers were due back to the clerk's office. Athena. It's September 17. Oh, so we have a little time in there. We have a meeting on August 19th. We have a meeting on August 26th. Then we have a meeting on September 9th. Alyssa. Just to be a further wet blanket associated with this. So on the 19th and the 26th, we can do almost no normal council yeah, business right. because we're going to be focused on the evaluation. I think that mm -hmm. it is entirely fair to manage expectations associated with this as a brand new thing that is in the charter and that is supposed to be reported back on. Um, I think that we can't get it done in time for this election. I appreciate the stage and comment, and it is theoretically possible that a minor thing could be done, but no candidate should be counting on this being available to them this fall. It's just, it's unrealistic because the office campaign political finance ideas, like I said, if this was possible to do, it would already be being done. So we're gonna have to find a way to really find our way along an edge of something that might be possible. So along those lines, what I'm hoping is perhaps um, just to boss Joel around a little bit here, that when they take this into account, maybe you could have a brief meeting and then throw it over to the attorney. And while you guys were away, let them work out if anybody else in Massachusetts has been able to figure out a way to do this. And that way they're busy working away while you're off on vacation. That sounds like a really good way of managing it. Because sitting down and saying, well, we'd really like to have videos. Well, we'd really like to have charts. We'd it doesn't, none of that matters. What matters is what we're allowed to do, right. and then we can flesh it out. Right. Dorothy. So again, this is what we're allowed to do. Can we have a link to the League of Women Voters uh, page with the with the candidates thing, or is that I'm, something that's very I difficult? Think, I think at this point we'd rather not sit here and debate what we can and can't do. Let the attorneys figure that one out. Are there other comments, questions? Are there comments from the audience? Okay, Alyssa, I want to hear this magical motion. <laughs> you see, this is the punishment I get for speaking yeah. up. Evan, by the way, has the right to chime in on this one too. If, if Evan has a better idea, I'm all for it. I, I was looking at just basically trying to pull the language out of section 7.6. So it could be something like, I move to refer to GOL, a recommendate, let's see, what I'm, something from GOL out here. Because what I'm trying to do is have GOL bring a process back to us. We're not sending a process to them, no one's written a process yet. But we're trying to get them to recommend a process to us, but then we still have to agree to it before it can be implemented. And it includes Charter Section 7.6, because it has to be compliant with state campaign, blah, 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 but we don't have to say all those words. I think that yes, was Randy clear John. motion. <laughs> so what about, um, I move that the council charges GOL with advising the council on a process for candidates to publish statements regarding their candidacy on the town bulletin board per charter section 7.6 comma with a report to the town council on July 20. 2, 2019. Okay. Athena. Initial report, Paralisa. Okay. Do you have it? Um, um, Uh, 
I move that the town council charges GOL with advising the town council on a process for candidates to publish statements regarding their candidacy on the town bulletin board pursuant to charter section 7.6 with a report to the town council, with an initial report to the town council on July 22nd, 2019. Okay. So that's, are you making that motion? Sure. Okay. <laughs> second. A se there's a, a su motion's been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion at this time? All right, so Thina, just to make sure that you've got it and we've got it, okay? I move that the town council charges GOL with advising the town council on a process for candidates to publish statements regarding their candidacy on the town bulletin board pursuant to charter section 7.6 with an initial report to the town council on July 22nd, 2019. Okay, the motion has been made and second. It is there any further discussion? Yes. Um, is it necessary to limit what candidates? We just said no. Okay. I don't think so at this time. That's consistent with the charter. All right. All those in favor, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. 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 Opposed. Abstain. Twelve zero zero one absent. Okay. Moving on. Uh, the next item is actually, Mandy Jo, you have three proposed um, charter char committee charge changes BCG, JCPC, and GOL. And we're prepared to show them up here. And I believe that the first two are pretty much straightforward, but why don't I just turn it over to you at this time? Yes, I'll, I'll speak to BCG first and then we can vote. And then I'll speak to the next ones after each vote um, and discussion. So BCG, this council on January 7th, 2019, actually referred to GOL when it adopted the original BCG charge to fix the formatting. Um, and so we have come up with a revised BCG charge, budget coordinating group charge. Um, the main changes um, are the addition of a purpose section completely because there was not one we could just transfer over to the new template. This charge was mainly revised to put it in compliance with the template that the GOL committee had adopted. Um, we turned the type to town from council um, given our learning on types of committees. Um, and beyond that, there really weren't any other changes. So the thing to look at is the purpose section. Um, the GOL committee on May 22nd, 2019, voted unanimously to recommend the council approve the revised BCG charge as amended at the meeting. That at the meeting, there were some copy editing amendments. Okay, are there questions or comments? The motion is to approve the revised BCG charge as recommended by GOL on June 24, 2019. Is there a motion? So moved. A second? Second. Evan is a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain, 12001. Okay, the next one, please. The next one is the JCPC charge. This one, um, on May 22nd, GOL also voted unanimously to recommend the council approve the revised JCPC charge as amended at the meeting. Again, um, this one looks like there's a lot more amendments, but um, basically, it just put it into the template and added a purpose statement again because the original charge that the council had passed did not have a purpose statement. The purpose statement tracks 
very much the charter language. Um, and so that was the biggest sort of addition um, to that charge too. Any questions? Um, so the motion at this point is to approve the revised JCPC charges recommended by GOL on June 24, 2019. Do I hear a motion? George? I so move. A second? Second. Mandy, uh, Pat DeAngelis. Any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? One absent. Okay. So it's 12001. The next one, please. The next, the next one is the Governance Organization and Legislation Committee charge itself. So our GOL committee is bringing to the council a revised GOL charge. Um, this one is in your packet. Um, and the goal of the revisions here were to bring the charge into compliance with the template that GOL adopted and also simplify the wording of the charge to ensure that there's precision in um, what the charge says and, it, and says we can do. Um, our original charge um, had two bullet points and we have extended that or separated that out into three bullet points, um, if I counted correctly. Um, and essentially what we did was split the first bullet point into two bullet points um, and then a, a separate one in there. And so that was in order to clarify what that first bullet point actually meant. There was a lot of clauses in that first bullet point and there was a lot of confusion by the council as to what was actually um, charged to GOL, and so the goal of this charge, this revision, is to clarify all of that. The report that was submitted on June 24th um, details all of that and the discussions that went on, um, and we voted on May 22nd unanimously to recommend that the council approve the revised GOL charge. Are there comments on this charge at this time? Yes, Darcy. I just would, uh, I have a question for you, Mandy Jo. Um, could you just give me an example of where you would advise the town council on matters of town governance and organization? Yes, um, that one would be most easily described as if the town manager submits a reorganization plan for the government as a whole. Um, it has to come to the council for approval. And so that would, under this charge, be referred to the GOL for that um, review under the charter and advising of the council for that review. So a reorganization plan submitted by the town manager is, is one. Um, another one is um, the organization of committees that the town that GOL has already undertaken to, to think about and look at the, the structure of town committees is another example. Thank you. Questions and comments? Uh, Kathy. Um, it's a comment more than a question. Uh, you've added a sub-bullet annually review the town council rules of procedure. And as you know, because we were on that committee, ad hoc committee together, we have it at least once a year. We're coming back at a minimum and looking at our committee structure, and we can just be affirming it. But the council needs to do it. So I just, you know, thinking this through, it's, I think it makes sense. Like, if it's something not working, is it working well? But I think we, should remember that we want to have the whole council take at least a quick look at it um, each year. So it's not just that it's the document that you look at it and say, how we doing? <laughs> yes. So is your, each of the bullets, the first two bullets, begin with the word advise. Right, and this one says annually review. Um, so that's the way it, it's written would be like just geo. So I'm just looking at it. I, it doesn't mean that just GOL is reviewing it, but it, 
implies that the review process is only happening at GOL. So may I respond? Lynn? Please. Um, it is a sub bullet of advise. And so it was meant to clarify that GOL would be the initial annual reviewer to bring anything back to the full council um, after that um, to make sure that no one forgets that we need to do it annually. But it, it wouldn't be GOL adopting changes to rules or anything without bringing them back to the council. It's part of the advise the town council on matters of town council rules, and that was intended to just say, and you got to do it annually at, at a minimum. Is there a question? Alyssa? So um, I appreciate that you're trying to separate things out because as we do this more, we come up with more examples of different things that we might be doing or that you haven't been given or that you which could be given. I'm uneasy about the fact that it includes resolutions, um, theoretically all town committee charges, not just committees that the council is affiliated with, but that's a conversation we've had another time, and so we'll talk about that again when it comes up. But it does say not including proclamations and citations, and I think that it's really important as a new body that we know that someone has looked at proclamations and citations other than putting all that burden on the president to do that, because we will get random things like college student painters asking us to give them a citation for the excellent work they did in Amherst, speaking from direct experience. And I don't want that to have to come to the council to, um, at first draft that way. I'd like it to go somewhere else first. And so I can appreciate that you don't want to necessarily have to meet just for that sort of thing. But then on the other hand, why can't people do things ahead? Also, when it comes to proclamations, like our annual proclamations or a brand new proclamation, I'd like to see them come. I'd feel more comfortable if I knew that another body of the council had looked at them before we did, particularly if it's on something new. Because we have had in the past other kinds of things that ended up having religious affiliations that not all of us are aware of and all kinds of complex things that for all 13 of us to scramble around wondering what those things are, I'm, I'm feeling like there would be a place that people could go so that when they contacted our president and said, I think I want to do a proclamation, she yeah. could say, go talk to them. The, I guess the real issue that has come up, and this is one I think you're addressing, and that is the anticipation of these before that gives the committee time to do that. Um, that's, yeah, Mandy Jones. So one of the committee's thoughts on removing proclamations and citations from the review requirement was the timing issue. Um, unlike resolution, and sometimes resolutions have a timing issue, but resolutions sometimes have um, something, say the council will do something, for example, the resolution on um, 100% renewable energy um, was a sort of adopting yeah. a position um, versus a citation of just citing someone's service. Um, and so GOL is currently looking at per referral rules around resolutions, proclamations, and citations and timing, but we were concerned if this charge continued to require a review um, that that there might be issues with timing. That doesn't mean we're open to not. It's just the council needs to realize if they want it reviewed before it comes to the council, there's timing issues. I, I will say that I think some guidance regarding proclamations and citations would be useful um, thus far. I felt, you know, mostly comfortable with them. Um, and some of them have come up really at the last minute. I'd like to think that as we mature as a council that that last minute function will become smoother and not the last minute. So the one question I would have is, is there a way for GOL to advise the council on some guidelines like you did, for example, on um, public ways with regard to proclamations and citations. 
because I do see it as a an area where we could find ourselves in somewhat of a awkward situation if we didn't have some guidance. Evan. So, so I think the question here um, is there's sort of two things that we're talking about, one of which falls under bullet point one and the other of which falls under bullet point two. Uh, so what the president was just talking about, sort of guidelines for proclamations, uh, process timing, all of that, that's something that is currently on GOL's future agenda um, as part of point one, which is matters of town council rules, governance, and organization, how the town council uh, receives and, and, and deals with proclamations and citations. Um, bullet point three, that really has to do with um, that key point there of reviewing for form, content, and organization to make sure it's clear, consistent, and actionable. And I think the one thing that we have to consider is that, um, you know, so GOL can't stop anything from coming to the council, right? We, we're just advisory and we, our, our, our purpose is we envision it as a committee is to work with sponsors to make their legislation essentially workable before it comes to the committee. And I think there was a feeling that because um, proclamations and citations um, don't really um, bind the council in any way to use Kathy's terminology from a previous debate, um, that, that that review of clear, consistent, and actionable didn't necessarily apply here. So if, if stu with using Alyssa's example, if student painters sort of came forth and said, we want a citation, um, GOL, under how it operates, wouldn't say no. We would say, OK, let's make sure that it makes sense, or it reads clearly, right? But that wouldn't actually address the underlying problem of do we want to give them a citation. Um, that would more adequately fall under bullet point one, which is sort of the process by which we receive and how we, we do that. So I think it's just clarifying which of these bullets we would talk about. Um, if you want to include proclamations and uh, proclamation citations in bullet point three, what you're asking for is a report from us that we actually look at, is it actionable, right? Is it legal? Um, does it, does it, is it consistent with how we've done things in the past? And we sort of felt like that wasn't necessary for us to do for proclamations. But of course, if the council has a, a differing opinion, we're open to it. Okay. Andy? I was just trying to think back on some of our experiences on the select board and because uh, Alyssa and I were both smiling and I think at exactly the same point. Uh, at least my experience, and Alyssa even has more years of experience than I do with it, is that uh, we would frequently receive requests for all sorts of uh, proclamations and resolutions, some of which were very valid and some were uh, more questionable, but uh, what what we uh, should do about them when it's a valid one, um, but it's really a group that needs assistance, and we, uh, you know, the the mean the, the, the intent is good, uh, but the expertise is not there, um, and there has to be a full range of assistance that's available, and uh, I hope for wording that's general enough that allows for full range of uh, assistance depending upon what's appropriate uh, under the circumstances of each individual situation, including at times recommending uh, against. Okay. Are there ways that we want to see this clarified or changed at this time? Evan. I hesitate to say what I'm about to say, especially given it hasn't been discussed by the committee, but I, I do wonder if th this is a point of concern among the council, if perhaps uh, we should wait to vote on a revised charge until after we've come forward with a recommendation on rules for proclamations and citations, because uh, that is on our agenda and maybe that would allay some of the concerns or maybe it wouldn't. But I, I also, I, I have concerns about 
revising this to include proclamations and resolutions and putting it into effect before we have rules on proclamations and resolutions. No. Yeah. Um, and so I sort of feel like they, they, the two things should probably go together. Okay. So in other words, we're probably going to table this for the moment and just have it come back. Okay. Is that acceptable? Okay. Thank you. Then we're going to move on to um, the next agenda item. Um, so the charter has um, two additional require three additional requirements according to section 1012 topics for study. Uh, by December 31st, 2019, the town council and town manager shall investigate the feasibility of taking the following actions. The list below is in no particular order of priority. So the first one is creating the position of American with Disabilities Act coordinator. B is to permitting non-citizens to vote in town elections and to seek and hold town elective office. And C is lowering the voting age for town elections. So in preparation for this, since we basically are now six months out from the deadline, um, you have before you two draft charges. Um, one is to, base, to deal with the ADA, or American with Disabilities Act coordinator. And the second is to combine the two that deal with voting into one. So the first one is, um, a, a, it's a um, draft charge, if you will, uh, to study the feasibility of establishing the position of ADA. And the second one is a charter uh, requirement to study the feasibility of permitting non-citizens to vote and hold elective office and lowering the voting age. So the voting ones are all put together in one. So let's take the first one. It's basically a draft charge, and the plan is that it would be referred to GOL, but if there are comments from either the council and then the public, this is the time. Mandy Jo. So, I just want to comment that I drafted the charges, um, sort of putting on my charter commission hat when doing so, um, but that I was hoping the discussion here wouldn't necessarily be to come to GOL with GOL to come up with either, you know, you could, if you like the idea of forming a committee, you can refer the charge draft to the GOL um, with guidance on is this good, is it not, and then come back with clear, consistent, and actionability or any changes here. If you don't like that idea, um, it'd be great to hear what the council might want to do about these charter provisions and how the council would like to work with the town manager to investigate the feasibility of these items prior to December 31st. Um, it does not necessarily have to be in these forms. It could be something else, but um, we need guidance. If you're going to refer to GOL, GOL definitely needs guidance on what the council wants. And in putting these together, they're actually fairly parallel in terms of kind of membership, if you will, um, and so forth. So let's just stick with the ADA one and see where we get to, okay? Are there comments? Yes, Alyssa. So we have long predating this town manager struggled with this issue in terms of having an American with Disability Acts coordinator. It's been given short shrift by the town for a long time. And so it's, it's great that it's in the charter that we should be looking at. At the same time, I'm, I appreciate that we were given the allowance to say that maybe it wouldn't necessarily be a committee like this. I actually feel like this is something that should just be advising the town manager. I would like it to not be subject to open meeting law. I would not like it to be a committee, but with the caveat that after they came up with some good ideas, whoever the town manager wants to bring into the room, which I'm sure will include members of DAAC and other activists throughout the community, 
is that then they would do, he would do some outreach before he ever told us more about it and say, oh, well, now that we've talked about this, I've talked to the community participation officer, I've talked with the, somebody from Stavros, and I've talked to some other members, long-serving members on DAAC, this is where I think we need to do now. Let's go talk to some people in this community. Let's go talk to some people in this community. Let's find out what so-and-so is doing over here and then bring that back to us. I'm not seeing that as an open meeting law necessity for a town position. To do that, I'm seeing this is something that advises the town manager, but that I would hope he wouldn't do entirely behind closed doors, but do some outreach after working with various stakeholders in the process. Comments? Dorothy. Um, I have a question. Uh, in the new sidewalk and road work, um, you're following some kind of federal guidelines on disability access. So how would this, um, committee interact with the um, sidewalk and road process beyond what is being done already? So there already is a disability access committee. Uh, this committee would examine the role of the idea of establishing a position as ADA coordinator um, as required by the charter. So it wouldn't really interact with the sidewalks or anything like that. That's anything that we do like that has to comply with ADA laws anyway. Andy. I think my, my biggest concern is the dynamics of what could occur here. Um, Finance Committee is not represented, and I'm not saying that it needs to be, but we have been trying to look at what the town's capacity is to just support the positions that we now have, to see if we have actual capacity to do anything else, and um, the answer is that I'm not sure we do. We also know that we have in the public safety realm some real concerns from our public safety staff that we pay attention there. So we're under a lot of financial stress. Um, I'm hesitant to set up something that is so structured that it leads a group of advocates to come in and advocate for a position and then um, create an unfortunate tension that I don't think any of us want, which makes it appear that financial responsibility and being responsible for compliance with the law and uh, addressing the needs of a very important group of individuals in our community uh, will battle, uh, go against each other. and. Uh, it's just a dynamic that I fear coming out of the way that this is proposed. Additional comments? We'll get to public comment in a moment, sir. Um, yes, Kathy. I had a similar reaction when I read this into the formality of it, and it seems to me it's a study group, and I, I just don't know. You know, we were wrestling when we were writing the rules. You know, what's a study group? What's an advisory group? What's an ad hoc? Because it's, it's, you, you want a few people to go out and figure out, do we need this position? What would they do, the person do? Uh, does any town have one? And what do they do that's different than the committee we already have? And just talk to a lot of pe people to try to figure out the role and to set it up with a counselor this way with lots of meetings doesn't seem like the right vehicle for it. I mean, I actually want people to go out to do some interviews and gather some information and come back and well perform, not sit around a table chatting. Um, I mean, they're going to have to come together and talk too. So I, I don't know what our other alternatives are. That's not what I'm, what can we call it that is Make sure it happens. Make sure it's not the town manager only point of view, you know, that there's some people advising and thinking about this. Does it have to have a counselor on it would be a question. If a counselor's on it, what does that trigger? So I don't know the answers to those questions. You okay. know, as soon as we put a counselor on it, does it make it something else? Okay. Evan. So this, this and the next one are probably the two issues for tonight's meeting that I've struggled with the most. Um, and I think the reason is, one, I am loath to create more committees for the town or for the council. Um, I think that we are already, 
that all counselors feel a little bit strapped, and I also think that uh, we're working really hard to fill all of the vacancies we have in our existing committees. Um, so the charter, I mean, the charter language is, is pretty vague. It just says the town council and town manager shall investigate the feasibility. Um, so we know that what we know is two things, right? The council has to be involved in some fashion, and the town manager has to be involved in some fashion. Um, and beyond that, I think we have a lot of flexibility. Uh, the, looking at the charge, um, I'm assuming we're saying the comptroller is sort of representative of the town manager, and that would be because the town manager is not actually on this committee, even though it's stated in the charge. So I guess we're saying the comptroller is representing the town manager, um, although I think there's a, a little bit of a weird dynamic there. Um, one current councilor makes sense that the council has to be involved, but I think there's a big debate then of who that councilor should be, uh, given that this is about creating uh, a position. It seems like it would have to be finance committee, um, but then I think there's also a lot of really good perspectives of others of the council that could add to this, um, but that financial component needs to be there. Um, and then the Disability Access Advisory Committee seems useful. Also, that's a committee composed of residents. And so the additional two residents at the end there, to some extent, I'm not sure is necessary because you already have a resident represented that has some expertise in this because they serve on the committee. And so I guess I'm wondering if it could just be the town manager or designee as he chooses, the counselor and a member of the Disability Access Advisory Committee, um, a, a committee of three people, which would maybe simplify it, or if there's a way to do it without making it so formal like Alyssa suggested um, and having to create another place where we have to post meetings and all of that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Pat. I was wondering, Paul, if you would respond to what, if you would respond to what's been said so far and share your thinking about this. So I think, I think Evan sort of summarized that it has to be the town council and the town manager. The, um, I, I agree with creating committees that have to be posted meetings and the recruitment of membership according to our process that would then get appointed through the OCA process. You're taking about two months through the summer to make that happen. Um, I think that you could delegate to the town manager to pull together a group to start to investigate. And then what I would look for is who do I talk to at the council? Would it be um, GOL to have that dialogue to say, bring it back so that there is that interaction between a committee of the council to say, well, you didn't do a thorough enough job or you didn't look at this perspective or someplace where people can come and comment on it. Because I think one of the things that we need to ensure is we need efficiency, but we also need a public process. So I think delegating out, I've heard what you said in terms of involving lots of different people, but then to have a pro place where it goes to have the conversation would be a useful approach. Mandy Jo. So is this something that instead of creating a separate committee, this one, and, and then I'm gonna make a suggestion for the other one, the investigating the feasibility of creating the um, ADA coordinator position could just be referred to finance to investigate. And then finance gets to control how they investigate it and how they, I mean, I guess if you read the charter closely as not reading it myself and just hearing Evan read it, the town council has to, the town manager has to, it doesn't say they have to do it together. Um, you know, so could we just say, well, that's creating a position that kind of relates to finance. Let's refer our responsibility to investigate to finance. Um, and they can work with the town manager if they want. They don't have to. The town manager has to do maybe his own investigation, maybe not somehow, and just leave it to finance to figure out. And I'm suggesting finance because it's a financial thing in a sense, but leave it to a council committee to figure out how to do that investigation. Dorothy. Um, I, I'm confused. What is the need? You, you have a citizens advisory committee. I mean, I don't know much about it, but what is it that they can't do that needs to be done with this new position and committee? Paul. I think that's a question for the charter. I mean, the voters voted to do to investigate this. I'm not prejudging whether this is a position that's needed or not, so. That's the question. Yeah, that's the question. Steve. So it seems like maybe we've already completed the work. Maybe we are the feasibility. 
committee. Um, yeah, so I'm not a big fan of the sort of prescriptive based directives and performance based. So the, I would see the la latter two as more performance based, that we shall increase the number of voters being more inclusive in voting. So for this one, it's just not clear, like it's kind of an odd directive to say, there sh should there be this position? I would, I mean, I wish it had been written that next step that we shall look at the issues of accessibility or something like that. But maybe there doesn't need to be See, now we're doing the feasibility study <laughs> as we speak. So one of the thoughts that I'm... Go ahead, Darcy. Um, I think that um, the obvious advocates for this, and I'm really glad that Mandy Jo put this together because it's in the charter and it makes sense to deal with it. Um, but um, I'm wondering if the current members of the Disability Access Advisory Committee are even aware that we're discussing this now and you know they would be the obvious people to be here advocating for it and have you know be be the people that would be pushing it forward if anyone did um, and so it seems like they they need to be part of this process of discussion and uh, so one of the possibilities is that um, that the town manager in consultation with appropriate other people, whether it's the advisory committee or whatever, come forward with a proposal, not necessarily for a position, but how this function is addressed in town, how this um, responsibility is met through the town and he can forward and communicate that to us and if there is a need for something uh, from a budget standpoint it then comes forward obviously not until next year's budget would be which would then come through the finance committee as well so that I'm hearing don't form another committee let's take people who already think about this have them talk with the town manager, and how do we either fill this position or not fill this position, but we still accept the responsibility and make sure we meet it, and does that have any financial implications, and then just bring it up that way. Alyssa. Yeah, I find that very helpful, and, and I think that although we like doing things, ooh, here's a new committee charge, and here's people on it, um, I think that we could do exactly that, and we could just ask for a particular timeline. We mm -hmm. could say, we'd like to hear back from the town manager. We don't have, there are other towns that use orders for this purpose. We haven't started doing that yet, but um, that would say we would ask the town manager to report back to us in X time frame about what that conversation was with DAAC, possibly more than one conversation, talking with the building inspector about things he's had. Because one of the things that I, I should have mentioned earlier, and I don't want to misspeak, and Mr. Malloy would correct me if I have the terminology wrong, but there is, a, because he's the staff, been the staff support to DAAC for a long time, is there is actually a plan that communities are supposed to have. And so one of the purposes of this person is to sort of ride herd on that plan, just like one is supposed to have a master plan implementation committee. That's not quite ever happened. So it's it's something that can be helpful, but whether or not it's gonna be another position, right, as opposed to the people who are cobbling it together out of their existing jobs, because we're getting the work done. It's just a matter of, looking at refocusing. Right. And so I think that just asking that we get a report back from the town manager seems like it should be adequate. And I'd really loathe to just stuff it over in finance committee as just like it's a position to fill or not. I just don't think we're there yet. So given that, I'm going to make a suggestion. And um, if anybody seriously objects, let me know. Uh, that on the meeting on the 22nd, that we come back with you with a motion that basically says, here's where, how we're gonna address this. And it includes, you know, working with a town manager, et cetera, and getting back to the council by such and such a time, rather than going through a charge at this time. Yes? Dorsey. But the, and the, that the motion would be around looking at the feasibility of 
Absolutely. Hiring a coordinator. Yeah. We do need to be responsive to the charter. Yes. There's no question about that. You know, for, yes, in public the, comment. I'm sorry. Was there a comment? Uh, I was just going to say, if you know, I, I like that approach in um, in private sector places where I've worked, the human resource person yeah. took on a, a part of their job and had to regularly be reporting on that, but was looking town townwide, company or entity wide. So I mean, there might be ways of saying how do you interact with the disability committee, and are we doing enough, and how to do more. Is there public comment on this? Yes, please come forward, sir. You've been very patient. So I raised my hand too, too early. My name's Chad. Um, my thought was the you already have a body for that, the Human Rights Commission. Uh, that uh, they could massage anything up that, that they were given. Unfortunately, you've been given something in the charter that doesn't list tasks, responsibilities, objectives, job descriptions. But somebody like that already does that sort of thing. They mm -hmm. work directly with, um, you know, um, uh, age, uh, gender. This is another one of the big six, as I <laughs> label it. So that might be a place. Okay. Thank you for your comment. Okay, so we're going to uh, look at this in a more, yes, Evan. Sorry, I, I think I just missed something. You're coming up with the motion? I'm more than glad to hear anybody I, anybody's idea, but I, what I was going to do was talk to the town manager, see about his ideas for how he might approach this and what's a reasonable time and then come back with you with a motion that is something that allows us to address this. I'm more than glad to refer that to a committee. <laughs> Alyssa. I don't feel the need to have you bring us back a motion. It's fine with me if you just talk with the town manager and say, let's look at our agenda schedule together. Okay. Can you report back to us about this at such and such date? Okay, we'll report back to you in the future, okay? Uh, now, on the voting one, which may be a different one, um, this is the one where we have to, by charter, look at permitting permitting non-citizens to vote in town elections and to seek and hold town elective offices and lowering the voting age for town elections. I, I'd just like to state again, I, I drafted it. I think it was just a starting point and the previous conversation, there's plenty of options, ways to do it. This is just one. Thank you. And that we needed to get this on the on our calendar, have it discussed and move forward. Dor Dorothy. Uh, this is a, <clears throat> a question. Uh, in school board elections, are non-citizens allowed to vote now? Well, we could do what you were saying before, do something in staging. I know in New York City, non-citizens have been allowed to vote in school board elections for 30, 40 years. Listen. So to follow up on that, that's illegal in Massachusetts. That's why it's not done in Massachusetts. So there have been home rule petitions that Amherst Town Meeting has passed over and over and over again that Ellen Story and Stan Rosenberg took to the legislature for us over and over asking that non-citizens be allowed to vote in local elections, Cambridge and others have, you know, who you might guess have done this as well, and it never gets anywhere in the legislature. So that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. It's just that this is a new attempt at trying to address that issue. There is always some renewed interest associated with presidential campaigns, et cetera, around these issues. So we can't, we can't just do it because we want to. We have to get special legislation to do it, and the legislators have been unable to get that through as special legislation. So while we ask for this, I think this one maybe does make more sense as a committee, but I would hope that if we do make it as a committee that we definitely designate someone under the age that we're looking at as being one of the members. Yindi. And I, following up on Alyssa's point that uh, this has been in process for decades now, uh, with multiple attempts to get to the, le the legislature has never acted on. Uh, my concern is, is that uh, having a uh, committee, we may need to recognize 
that the committee may need to have some duration um, because uh, its work will not expire on January 31, 2020. Uh, the odds that uh, something will be proposed and magically approved by the legislature uh, are pretty, pretty close to zero given our past experience. And the charter only says we have to investigate the feasibility. It doesn't say we have to have it in place. Uh, yes, Evan. So despite not 10 minutes ago talking about how much I don't want to create any more committees, uh, I, I do actually agree with Alyssa that this is probably one where a committee makes sense. Um, I think there's a lot to talk about with this committee, and I, I do have some concerns about just referring it to GOL because I think that some of the questions about the committee, such as who should be on it, are beyond really the scope of GOL. Um, and it really should be something for this council. Um, for me personally, and I haven't fully thought this through, um, I, I would actually be interested in looking at the option of removing the word charter from it and removing ad hoc and having it be sort of a more long-term electoral reforms committee that can look at beyond just these things mandated by the charter, but look at uh, many of the other things that many people on this council at our last meeting expressed interest in seeing our elections improved. I think there's been a lot of energy. I know that the town clerk for a while had assembled a voting coalition. Um, that I'm not quite sure what's happened with that since, but there was a lot of energy around that. Um, and maybe this is an opportunity, given that we already have to do these things, to take a broader look beyond just the charter mandated things that we have to do. Um, but I think that's a bigger discussion and, and also has a bigger conversation about membership. Okay, further comment. Yes, Steve. Yes, yeah, so I support this one also. And my only change would be to remove the word reform because it, it may or may not be reform, but it's change. And it's really addressing the two bullets that I mean, some may see it as reform, some may not see it as reform. So I think it makes it less, mm -hmm. um, makes it more inclusive if we just keep it more neutral. If, so we're now talking about a couple different things. First of all, this is, the charter requires that there is two issues that we've stated here that have to be studied uh, or looked at the investigate the feasibility of taking the following actions. Whether or not we make this into a longer term committee that looks at any number of electoral issues um, or not, its first charge is going to have to be the feasibility of those first two. And I truly appreciate both Alyssa and Andy sharing with us the historical efforts that have been made both in Amherst and in other parts of the state and the extent to which those have gone to the legislature. Um, so, because feasibility may be all we can look at. Um, so, but making it into a bigger committee, I think we have to look at this charge much more seriously with a much bigger eye toward what all we want it to accomplish and therefore what should its membership be. Because I assume that you're saying this would be the committee that would look at campaign finance. This would be the committee that would look at some of the other issues that were brought up during the campaign finance. Yes, Evan. Yeah, yeah I think potentially. And I think many of the other issues around um, just our elections, again, kind of building off what the town clerk had started. I do have uh, one question. So by December 31st, 2019, the town council and town manager shall investigate the feasibility. Is the implication that that investigation needs to begin by December 31st or conclude by December 31st? Andy Joe. I think the Charter Commission intended it finish by December 31st. And they may conclude that 
by December 31st, they can't conclude, but <laughs> um, it's the reality is it's, um, are there further comments about the expansion of this committee's charge? Because if that's the case, then this charge needs to be worked on. Alyssa. Instead, I'm, I'm gonna make it more complicated by saying maybe we can consider narrowing it not unlike the other issue we just dealt with, which is that we could ask, we, yes, we will be involved eventually again, but as time ticks away here with the summer, if the town manager wants to get, the, get together with the town clerk, that previous group that the town clerk had brought together that was excited about various elections, um, some, uh, some young person who's probably come and talked to us uh, before um, and talked about what would a committee, even if that group wants to talk about, what should a committee look like? What would we do to, do to explore this feasibility and then come back to us with that rather than us trying to charge them in and trying to recruit people for this particular thing and how on earth will we choose between people? I'm just one more posted committee. Whatever comes out of that could then grow into a larger reforms or changes sort of committee. It may be that the feasibility is this very tiny thing that says, well, it's not very feasible right now. So let's have a long-term committee where we try and do X, Y, Z, and that committee should include people from the League of Women Voters, from the high school, um, you know, student body, president, whatever. And, but for us to try and figure all this out in this short period of time as a larger committee or even as a small committee just feels like a lot of work and not necessarily gonna get us any closer to getting it done. So I would tend to want to push this one over to the town manager and say, talk to your staff and come back to us with a suggestion. Mr. Bachman, given that we don't, we have just lost our town clerk and we have an interim town clerk and we're searching for a town clerk and we're under, understaffed in the town clerk's office, how would you like to respond? Um, we'll figure it out if that's what the council wants us to do. Um, you know, there are certainly staff is um, stretched, especially in the clerk's office at this moment in time, but hopefully that will change pretty short in, in the relatively near future. Um, it's an aggressive timeline to um, address. These are pretty complicated major topics. Other communities have addressed them, so there is some learning uh, that we can go, that we, we can do from other communities who have done, who have submitted legislation for uh, younger people to vote uh, and things like that, and non-citizens to vote. Um, but I think, you know, we, you know, we have talented staff who can take on additional things, and we'll work on it. Okay, Evan. So. The reason I asked whether or not the December 31st deadline was the date we have to start or end by, and it sounds like end by, is because I actually do think that that really matters here. Um, because now I'm thinking, right, if we are going to make this a committee, we refer to GOL today, GOL ideally finishes talking about it and all the other things, and we can vote to create the committee on July 22nd. Now it has to be posted. We have to recruit people. We have to appoint people. The committee gets going maybe what I mid September in a, like a super ideal situation, and now we have a committee that's meeting for its first time and has from mid September to late December, uh, a time that is filled with holidays, mm -hmm. um, to come forth with a recommendation. Uh, currently serving uh, with Darcy on energy and climate action and trying to deal with the 90-day deadline for goals and recognizing how difficult it is to come together as a committee and have an immediate deadline in front of you, um, that might not be something that's fair to put on a new committee. So at this point, we're not expanding the committee. We're questioning whether we're creating a committee. And we're reverting back to Let's see what the town manager might do. Yes. So Mandy, did you go? is another option just us asking the town manager to ask our town attorney whether it 
is feasible to in this current state and law to is there any way we could and how that would happen is the feasibility that we would need to file special legislation um, would that then satisfy having investigated the feasibility of doing these three things if we get an opinion from the town attorney that says in order to do it this is what you would need to do sounds very reasonable <laughs> mr bachelman <laughs> Okay, this is going back to the town manager who will speak to the town attorney and we will hear from you all later, okay? Anything further? Yes, Darcy. I would just say, just like the, uh, the, the previous issue, um, I think the, the people that are really uh, most interested in this, again, they, they didn't really have notice that we were even gonna, gonna talk about it. Um, they probably don't know what was in the charter. They, they don't know anything about this. So um, to the extent that they can be involved in this process, um, that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay. There were a couple different groups besides the league that came forward as we were looking at the um, earlier uh, campaign finance reform and spoke to us who are residents in town and perhaps the manager might also talk with them, okay? And there are also there are a number of groups in town that work with, um, you know, um, different refugee groups or undocumented immigrants, et cetera. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, yes, uh, Pat. Are we talking about any resident of Amherst when we say non-citizen would include undocumented people, or are we talking about documented non-citizens? The charter is not clear. Yes. You shouldn't have left the room. We might have assigned you something. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Andy. Uh, I think that it's a good question. It was just asked and that it, we need to have the, a group eventually address that issue. But to get back to what um, has been done previously in the multiple town meeting resolutions, it was uh, people who were uh, legal res uh, essentially green card holders. They were not uh, undocumented. And uh, he was very clear on that subject. Uh, I point that out uh, in part to remind you that the legislature, even with that limitation, mm -hmm. um, the leadership in the legislature was clear that it had absolutely no interest and wouldn't allow the vote to go forward. Okay. All right. Any further discussion on this? All right. Then we're moving on to appointments. And um, the OCA has been very busy. Town manager's been very busy. So we have six different committees, and Evan, um, as the chair of OCA, let's just start down the list. I'm going to try to keep these very brief, since there are six sets of appointments coming forward tonight, but we'd be happy to entertain questions. And if any member of the committee feels as though they want to add something about the deliberation, um, please don't hesitate. Uh, so starting with Historical Commission, OCA debated this on 6-17-2019. Uh, we did note that for Historical Commission, Human Rights Commission, Local Historic District Commission, and Public Art Commission, uh, we had an initial conversation with the town manager um, where we gave him some feedback about the appointment memos that he's been providing and the, um, and the information that was provided in them. Uh, the town manager then submitted updated memos to us. And so what we voted on um, and what we're, we're recommending were the updated memos uh, that were received uh, by the town council, I believe on June 14th. Yes, so originally filed 6-7, um, updated 6-14. And so that, that update uh, 
because you might be wondering, what, why is there an update? Um, the update was predominantly um, to expand the information that was available um, on the background of the appointees and also to fix some clerical errors. Um, so on historical commission, OCO is unanimous 5-0, recommending approval. Questions on this one? And Evan, do you want to go ahead and make the motion? It's right up there. Thanks. Sure. Uh, then I will move to confirm the following town manager appointments to the Historical Commission, effective July 1, 2019, as recommended by the Outreach Communications and Appointments Committee report of July 1, 2019, for three-year term to expire June 30th, 2022, Patricia Auth, who's a reappointment, Robin Fordham, another reappointment, Theodore Parker, reappointment, for two-year term to expire June 30th, 2021, Jane Wald, who's a reappointment, Jane Scheffler, and for a one-year term to expire June 30th, 2020, uh, Hetty Startup. Is there a second? Second. Mandy Jo seconded. Further questions or comments? Then all those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? 12001. One absent. Okay, next one, Local Historic District Commission. On June 17th, OCA voted unanimously to recommend approval of uh, the town manager appointments to local historic district commission. Questions at this time? You want to make the motion? Uh, you're going to make me read all these. Huh? Gonna, I, happy. I, see why you, I see why you did this. Ha <laughs> ha. I'll do it. All right, so I move to confirm the following town manager appointments to the local historic district commission, effective July 1, 2019, as recommended by the Outreach Communications and Appointments Committee report of July 1, 2019, for three-year term to expire June 30th, 2022, Peggy Schwartz, Greta Wilcox, and Karen Winter, and for a two-year term to expire June 30th, 2021, Morian Adams, who's a reappointment, and Jennifer Taub, also a reappointment. Any questions? Second? Second. It was George. Any questions? All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Okay. So it's 12 zero, zero, and one absent. Okay, I'm going to relieve you. I'm going to suggest that somebody else from your committee do the next I'd one. I'd be happy to do that, Madam George. Chair. George. <laughs> so I would like to make the motion. This is for the Human Rights Commission. And I would move that the council confirm the following town manager appointments to the Human Rights Commission, effective July 1, 2019, as recommended by the Outreach Communication and Appointments Committee report of July 1, 2019 for a three-year term to expire June 30, 2022, Matthew Charity, that's a reappointment, and Romarin Speck. Two-year appointment to term, excuse me, to expire June 30, 2021, Benjamin Harrington, Deborah Neubauer, and Gazit Kaya Nikosi. Um, One-year term to expire June 30, 2020, Sid Ferreira, that's a reappointment. Second. And just for clarification, what was the vote of Broca? Uh, so OCA voted on June 17th unanimously 5-0 to recommend these appointments. Okay. Are there any questions? All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Okay. 12 zero, zero, and one absent. Who wants to do public art? Which OCA member? Um, Excellent. Alyssa. Okay. So the... Motion is in front of you to confirm, I'll tell you the vote in a minute, but to confirm the top following town manager appointments to Public Art Commission, effective July 21, 2019, as recommended by OCA's report of July 1. Three-year terms to expire June 30th, 2022. James Barnhill, Jacqueline Sheridan, and Shoshona King, who is a reappointment. Then two-year terms to expire June 30th, 2021, both of which are reappointments, Amy Crawley and Ellen Kiter. The uh, vote is as stated on our report, which was 5-0 on June 17th. I do just want to point out one thing here associated with this one, and that's that we still have a vacancy. And so for those of people watching out in the audience who said, wow, wouldn't it be amazing to serve with those people? Yes, please put in your CAF and uh, please apply because we do still have a vacancy. 
Okay, the motion's been made. Do I have a second? Second. Pat's a second. Any further discussion? Any further points for the report? Andy. Uh, somebody remind me, I think that it calls for seven members in the committee charge. I know that there's one position at least remaining to be filled that you mentioned. Are there two remaining to be filled? No. <laughs> okay. One, two, three. But that's because one's not showing because they, they aren't up, up for They aren't for, up for Thank reappointment. You. Thank you. I was just going to say, I thought there was a name missing, but <laughs> got it. All right. Any further discussion on this? Thank you for that point of clarification. Bill Kazin is continuing as a member. His term expires next year. Thank you. Uh, all, any, okay, motion's made and seconded. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, abstain? No. 12, zero, zero, one absent. Okay. Evan. Sure. Uh, excuse me, Lynn, before you go forward, yeah. I need to recuse myself from the Affordable Housing Board of Trustees because I have a personal relationship with one of the possible appointees. Okay, thank you. Um, Evan. Uh, so if you read the OCA report today, which perhaps you did, um, you would notice that this is not in the OCA report. Um, the reason for that is OCA voted on this set of appointments this morning at our meeting today. Uh, normally we would try our hardest not to vote in the morning uh, for something that you have to do in the evening. However, uh, because this was filed on June 20th, and because we don't meet again until July 22nd, if we did not take this up tonight as a council, we would lose out on our opportunity to weigh in. So apologies for not having a written report. OCA did discuss these today, and we did vote 5-0 uh, to recommend approval. Uh, there was one, um, uh, two points that were made um, that uh, a committee member asked would be brought up, uh, one of which was the disclosure that one of the candidates is the spouse of a current town councilor. I think we figured out who that was. Um, and the other one was that you'll notice in the memo uh, that the two of the reappointments, Thomas Kegelman and Nancy Schroeder, does not list their initial date of appointment, um, although we did learn that later on. And I although I don't have it right in front of me. I don't know, Listen, do you know the initial date? I'm sorry, Kegelman's actually does list it, but Schroeder's does not, and it was 2017, and I resent that email, and if anybody needs the exact date, I'll find it. Uh, so in that case, I'll, I'll move to confirm the following town manager appointments to the Affordable Housing Board of Trustees, effective July 1, 2019, as recommended by the Outreach Communications and Appointments Committee verbal, verbal report on July 1, 2019. A two-year term to expire uh, June 30th, 2021, Rob Crowner, Carol Lewis, Erica Pydade, and William Van Huevelen. And one-year term to expire June 30th, 2020, John Hornick, who's a reappointment, Thomas Kegelman, who's a reappointment, and Nancy Schroeder, who's a reappointment. Is there a second? Second. George, is the second? Any further discussion? All the, yes, Mandy Joe. Could I just get clarification from the town manager on what's going on with, I think the town manager is technically a part of this committee. Is, I, does it have nine members and you're one of those nine? That's correct. Okay, and who's the ninth then? Mm. There's seven listed there. Oh, Sid Ferreira is continuing. Okay. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Abstain? Uh, so it is, how do you count somebody who doesn't vote? Abstain? No. Absent, okay. So it's 11, zero, zero, and two absent. I think she needs counted as recused. Recused, thank you. Uh, no. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, the Public Shade Tree Committee. All right, Evan. 
as so, long as your voice holds out. <laughs> so um, I want to start by saying that of the six sets of appointments in front of you today, this is the only one that's not coming to you with a unanimous vote. Um, again, we voted this one this morning, so apologies for not having a written report. The vote for this was 401. There was one abstention. Um, that one abstention was because a constituent asked that counselor uh, not to vote for one of the uh, appointees put forth by the town manager, so there was an objection by a constituent who asked that counselor uh, not to vote for that appointee, and so that counselor abstained. Um, so the vote again this morning was 4 0 one. Uh, I'll read the motion. We move to confirm the following town manager appointments to the Public Shade Tree Committee, effective July 1, 2019, as recommended by the Outreach Communication and Appointments Committee, verbal report July 1, 2019, three-year term to expire June 20th. Uh, June 30th, 2022, Claire Bertrand, Bennett Haslip, and Gordon Green, who is a reappointment. Two-year term to expire June 30th, 2021, Shoshana King, Henry Lappin, who is a reappointment. And one-year term to expire June 30th, 2020, Nani Burak, who is a reappointment. Is there a second? I have a question. Uh, George, question. Okay. Um, Shoshana King is on both on the Public Art Commission and the Public Shade Tree Committee. Is that... Um, unusual or? Sid Ferreira is on too. Sid Ferreira evidently is on oh. too as well. So it's not, it's not unusual. Okay. Darcy? I just have one question I forgot to ask this morning and I actually didn't even notice it because I was focused on something else. but. Just have a question for you, Paul. Of um, how do you how do you decide who gets a three, two, and one year term, and why? I think Nani has been on the Shade Tree Committee for a while now, and I am just wondering why she got a, not, a one year term. So it's a good question. Um, the typically what I do is look at. Um, if it's for a reappointment, how many years they've already served. And so Nani has served a long period of time, so I gave her the shortest time, mainly because we didn't have other applicants for this uh, committee at this time. So if we have new applicants, and uh, the policy of the, the handbook policy for, uh, of appointed boards that we've been working under encourages turnover. But since there, was no, there were no other appointments or applicants, Nani was able, and, uh, and the same with Henry Lapham, you can look in, the memo talks about how long they have both served. Henry is the chair, so that's why I gave him a slightly longer term. Uh, and Gordon Green had, had just, he had one term so far, so he is entitled to a, a full second term. Um, and then other than that, uh, my logic on this one was because Shoshana King also was appointed to the Public Art Commission, I gave her a shorter term as opposed to the other two candidates who, um, who were given three-year terms because they interviewed and were very um, enthusiastic about serving. Further questions? Yes. I'm trying Steve. to find the answer to this on my own, but are there continuing members of this also? This is, yeah. this is in the reports yeah. that the town so, manager yes. gives so, us, but yes, yes, Rachel Loeffler Rachel. is continuing as a member in her, yeah. So the math does add up, it is important, I understand. Yes, okay. the math does add up that that person is continuing and the town manager was clear in his report on that, so thank okay. you. Are there further questions? Then hearing none, uh, the motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor say yes and raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Opposed, abstain, one abstention, and absent one. So it's 11, zero, one, and one. All right. I'm yes. sorry, Lynn. I should have said this earlier. I was pulling up that email again. If we could just have the minutes reflect, since it wasn't in the town manager's report, that the date that Nancy Schroeder had started serving on the trust was August 14th, 2017, then it's like we covered everything that's normally in the report. And it's. Thank um, you. That would be great. Yes. I just would like to acknowledge the hard work of the town manager and the people in his office and also the resident advisory 
committee who have worked very hard over the past couple of months. They've given my committee a lot to do, but we're very grateful and I'm appreciative of their hard work. Just want to rec recommend them for that. Thank you. I, I have to say I was pretty impressed by how many came forward. <laughs> um, all right. The second thing under appointments is Clerk of the Council. At this point, Athena O'Keefe is presently serving in a temporary role, as her little sign says. Um, so, uh, there may be a step I missed in here, and if I did, I am totally apologetic. Um, what I did do was review the sections of the charter. Uh, we did advertise a vacancy, though we did not advertise, quote, a position, since we are allowed to hire a town employee, and we honestly do not have sufficient funds to hire a full-time full new total position. Uh, we developed a draft, much to thank you, Margaret, uh, for this, of the accurate job description. It is a draft. Um, before, uh, two weeks ago, Mr. Bachelman appointed um, Athena and also appointed um, another member of the town as the clerk of the clerk, town clerk as well. Um, but for the town clerk of the council, it was Athena. I've met with Athena. I've talked with her about uh, her interest in the position. And I have to say what most impressed me is some of her innovative thoughts about how to help the council in our own visibility and coordination, working both with us and with um, the rest of the staff who has been supporting us as well. This position is not going to be shared as the town clerk position, which um, I think Margaret um, did an amazing job doing both, and she would probably tell you never to do it again. So uh, let's have questions at this time, and if then we'll see whether we go through a motion. Yes, Dorothy. So um, what percentage position is it? <laughs> it's a very good question. Um, we, at this point, estimate it to be somewhere around 60%, but it, it fluctuates. And it fluctuates, for example, I'll just give you an example. This is our fifth Monday night meeting in a row. That's not normal, we hope. Uh, <laughs> and so that makes, for instance, the month, month of June pretty exceptional with regard to number of meetings. And yet other months don't have as many, and sometimes the issues are not as complicated, uh, and so forth. But it, it's a, somewhere around 60%. So is the rest of Athena's time, will it be a town clerk? That is really something to be worked out with the town manager because there's also an issue of the position not being a union position versus what other responsibilities. So that has to be worked out. And that's why it, their charge reads the way it does. I also want to thank Alyssa for making sure that we did the statement that we did that consisted of advertising a vacancy um, because we had to have 14 days on that, I believe. Yes. So then I'll take the blame as well because oh. I don't think that what we put up was adequate notice to comply with 6.2. Um, it, I think any plain English reading of 6.2 would 
indicate a vacancy, uh, some form of job application that someone could put in that a position was going to be filled in XYZ time as opposed to what we ended up putting up, which was a very fine press release that talked about the work that Margaret had done for us and we put at the end that it qualified for that, right. but I, I, I'm not really feeling it, but that's a conversation we can all have and this could possibly be put down to, you know, uh, beginner's luck sort of thing as we're trying to sort this out. Along those same lines, I think maybe some of this got copied and pasted from a previous job description in that item six says manages staff assigned to prepare minutes of committee meetings. And I think all of us on council committees would be thrilled to know that there were staff assigned to prepare minutes of committee meetings. But since those staff do not currently exist, I'm wondering what that means. So I'm gonna to turn to Mr. Bachman because we've been having this conversation. Please. Yeah. So it's our intention in, to have staff, and we've I've actually had this conversation with the school superintendent who has a similar need uh, to do minutes for your committees. Um, it would not be, other than the full council meeting, it would not be Athena doing those minutes. It would be someone else who would be responsible for those minutes. Um, but we understand the need to have some, a standalone person or people who would be dedicated to doing the minutes for you so you're not trying to work as a committee member and do minutes at the same time. Um, so we've looked at some shared positions with the, with the school superintendent uh, because he is experiencing similar demands on his staff and but our intent is to have something set up uh, as soon as we can. Either part-time positions who will take on a committee who will do the minutes for you or one person who will do multiple committees um, it's kind of important for us to understand the rhythm of the committee structure so we can talk to people about what the time commitment is expected to be. I think we're getting a sense of that now, um, and I think that will help us uh, recruit people to do this job. And so the reason, so the clerk would be uh, responsible for making sure the minutes were done in a timely manner, were posted appropriately. Um, these would be minutes takers, but the, the clerk, to the clerk of the council, would be responsible for making sure all the um, minutes were up to up to code, basically, and and distributed for approval, and then posted online as, as required. And they would coordinate to make sure that every meeting was covered. Okay. Is there another question? Yes. So aside from the notice requirement of 6.2, my other question, and again, this is brand new to us, is you had indicated at a previous meeting that you would talk to the town manager about this, and you obviously did because there's a huge amount of information here, including a position description. I guess I'm trying to understand since as a select board member, the only person I ever got to hire was the town manager. As a school committee member, I had a couple more choices. As a town councilor now, we're doing this hiring. What's we, since we only have two people, and one and a part of a person that we own, it's not like we need like a personnel committee per se, but how does this work? Does everybody just feel good about, okay, good, there's a job description, we're done with it, or is there something that I don't want to hold up this process necessarily, but if she were to ever leave us, um, What's our read on this? I'm just trying to get a sense from the council what our ex shared expectation is here. Let me add to that. I also have raised the issue of how do we evaluate and I feel that you know that's a something where we um, all have things that we might add to the evaluation. I think it might be done a bit differently than the town manager. Thoughts? Dorothy. Can you clarify, what, what are we talking about right at this exact moment? My question was, can, is the town council just accept that somebody wrote a position description for the only other person we hire other than the town manager and we're fine with that? I'm assuming we don't need a committee to look at it, but can, can we move forward with this now? Do we feel the need to study it more? We did get a chance to read it since, you know, Friday. Um, I, it's just new, right? It's a new thing for us. Things can be changed. I mean, I, we're going ahead and we're trying to find somebody and hire somebody. Um, 
once you see people, sometimes you decide to change the description. I don't, I don't think that a description is a legal contract. Yes. So I think it's important that we're not hiring someone. You're using, under, under the charter, you have the provision to appoint someone who may be an existing town employee. Right. So that's the, that's the action under the charter that you're acting under, that, you, um, that you're appointing someone who's an existing town employee, just like you did with Margaret when she was an existing town employee. If this were a new position that you were hiring for, it would go through a, 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 a much more rigorous hiring process with, with, a, with a posting, advertisement, We'd go through, the council would need to decide how it was going to interview people, review resumes, do all those types of things. That's not what this is. This is, this, the charter allows you to appoint someone who's an existing town employee. Now when you appoint someone who's an existing town employee, there are things to work out. We were fortunate at, at the last time when we hired, we were, um, the town clerk was hired with the, the premonition that, that the council might, hire, might use the town clerk as the clerk to the council. We didn't know back in July of a year ago when we hired Margaret that she would, um, that you would actually appoint her, but we had laid the groundwork saying, if you get hired, and I interviewed all the people, I said, if you get hired, you may be appointed by the, the council, so be prepared for that. We want you, we, that's where we'd like it to go. We think it made sense. I think our experience has been that the clerk serving as both a clerk and the council. I think Margaret did a terrific job on it. I don't know if anybody else could have. She was a, she's a unique character. And so her advice to us, and I think was to um, separate those positions somewhat, um, but whether it's a clerk to the council is a full-time job or not, if it was a full-time standalone job, then we would advertise it and go through the interview process. We think it's a, it's a lot more than what it's a lot more than what we allocated for Margaret to do it. So I think that that's um, the idea today is you would tell me, go and make this happen. I would meet with the union, talk about the position. The clerk, to, the clerk of the council has to be, um, be able to go into executive sessions and take minutes so it can't be part of the, of the union. So we negotiate the position, out, that, this role out of the union. Um, but also maintain other responsibilities that uh, the clerk could could have currently. Uh, the, um, so I think that there's a little work to be done in, in discussing with the town clerk and with the, the union. But I think we can make it happen. We've had some preliminary discussions. I think we'll be on the same page and it'll, it'll work out okay. Yes, okay. Additional questions? Dorsey? Is, uh, does, it, does it seem like this is something that should be going through the OCA committee? As per the charge? That was something actually I did discuss with Alyssa, the town manager discussed with Alyssa, and it was felt that it was not, but I'm charge seems to say that it is make recommendations to the town council regarding all appointments by the town council serve as the committee to review and advise the town council on all candidates forwarded by the town manager for employment as department heads i'm not sure that's what it is but just wondering why it isn't going through oka Alyssa. We had a five-minute conversation standing here <laughs> yeah. when we were trying to figure this out. This was not a big elaborate thing. This was a, oh my gosh, we have a whole bunch of dominoes falling and can we get this up so that we would be able to capture the person we wanted to do the work. Um, I'm not sure what would go through OCA because this is not a committee appointment. This is a town council appointment, not a hire, as you point out. It is. It is perhaps the only viable unicorn of all the unicorns we've discussed in terms of being different. than It literally is different than everything else. And I think that I feel more comfortable with the notice that we used, given again that it's not a full hiring process, right? That's not what you would do when it talks about the typical, because of course, one part of the charter talks about the fact that this person works for the council a different part of the charter says, whenever a vacancy occurs or is about to occur in any town office or town employment, 
not talking about the department heads, but just literally anybody who can work here whenever we have a vacancy. That's a 14 days. Vacancy is kind of a funky word associated with this in terms of really our is. real ab ability to appoint, assign, working with the town manager. So I apologize if, at, you know, I didn't ever take it back to OCA. I literally waited to see what was going to happen next. I was actually quite amazed that such a full package was put before us this weekend to look at tonight. And so that was why I just wanted to make sure everybody was good with where we were. And like I said, I couldn't see a personnel committee coming out of this or OCA necessarily having any role in this because it's not the same as a committee appointment and it's not something we're confirming at the town managers. It's a suggestion, just like it was a, arguably, I would say a very strong suggestion that we have Margaret as the clerk of the council because that was the condition that he hired her under. But this seems like a really good fit and everything and so I'm not arguing about the person at all. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page for our expectations. Evan? So the OCA charge, make recommendations to the town council regarding all appointments by the town council, specifically references charter section 2.9, and of course the very first thing listed under charter section 2.9 is appointment of clerk of the council. So it actually does seem it's like charge. it's in OCA's charge. That said, of course, it's always within the ability of the town council as a whole to waive that. And so if the council, I, I would argue that maybe should have gone to OCA, um, but if the council feels as though, uh, given the situation we're in, there is no need for OCA review or OCA cannot provide something meaningful to this discussion beyond what we've already had, um, then it's fully within the right of the council to say, we're not going to have OCA look at this, but I, I would imagine it would have to be a formal vote of the council. Sarah. So actually, oh, actually, when I saw this, one of the things that I thought was that it did fit under OCA, not that we want to take on anything. Um, so two points I would make on that is one of the things that was brought up is that perhaps we want to take another, we, the council itself would like to maybe review what we're putting in for a job description, because that might evolve. Um, so that might be something that OCA could take up the initial work of and could also, you know, do some of the looking at candidates and similar to the process that we already have and then bring it to town council. Um, it, it could be that that's just an unnecessary step, but then again, I'm looking at consistency. So to me, it, it seems consistent. Um, and the other thing is that um, while I incredibly respect the institutional knowledge of oh. Councillor Brewer, I, I do think that, that maybe, you know, some decisions I think um, is something that would be good for all of us to talk about while taking into consideration that some people know way more about how things have worked and do work well. Um, I would just make that point. Yes. Given that this is an interim position that we're talking about and we've had direct, no, we're talking about appointing her as the, you know, given that. <laughs> she presently we, holds the interim position. Right, yes. Thank you for the correction. I'm tired. Um, I, we have worked with Athena. We've seen the quality of her work and I feel that this is one of the few times that we could comfortably bypass OCA. Kathy. I, I just want to say real briefly that people may or may not remember, but when we adopted the rules of procedure, we have a whole section called the clerk of the council, which has a job description in it. With, and this was actually at the request of Margaret, because we said, what does the president do? What do other people do? So she's, and I just cross-checked that the brief description matches this. Yeah. So we, we did spend time thinking about, you know, aside from taking minutes, what, what was the role of the clerk, and we spelled it out. Not to say this is perfect, but it's in writing, and we adopted it. Okay. Sarah, did you have your hand up? 
So I was just going to make the clarifying point that I didn't mean that we that OCA would need to take it up right now. I mean, I'm just saying that if it's something that the council decides that it just it was brought up that maybe the council would want to review or change or in the future it could be something that does fit with the OCA charge. But obviously, I don't think we need to do it right now. Okay. Is there any other comment? Yes, Mandy Jo. So while we're talking about this. Um, I'll always put a plug in for GOL. Um, in terms of job descriptions, you could argue that GOL's charge um, is where the job description of the clerk of the council falls because it relates to organization of the council. So I'm just gonna put that there. Um, I do wanna say that I'm comfortable avoiding the OCA process on this one or skipping it. Um, we already, as a council have sort of stated that the current OCA process is not working for appointments. And so right now OCA doesn't really have a process to go through trying to figure out how to appoint or recommend an appointment um, for the council, number one. Um, so they're, I don't believe OCA may be ready to do that right now for the clerk of the council position. And when I, and the second one I wanted to make is when I think back to when the OCA charge was adopted, um, I don't recall considering that clerk of the council or the town manager would be automatically put to the OCA committee um, that and so I'm not sure this council made a actual decision when passing that charge to say, yes, OCA gets the town manager appointment. Yes, OCA gets the clerk of the council appointment in terms of who the recommendations come from. Um, maybe I'm remembering things wrong, but I don't think we had that conscious decision being made versus just talking about reviewing town manager appointments and then the committee appointments that we have to make. Um, so I, it, I think that's a discussion to have later, but I would argue tonight to go ahead and appoint Athena as our clerk of the council um, and maybe then put on a future agenda item a real discussion about the OCA charge as it stands right now about a whole bunch of things similar to the discussions we've had about the GOL charge. Another one that was done really early on. Um, maybe it's time to have one about the OCA charge. Any further discussion? Yes, Evan. So again, I do just want to clarify that the council did, when we wrote the charge, actively put in the reference to charter section 2.9, which includes clerk of the council, uh, town manager, appointment of the town manager is 3.1. So. That charter reference appears nowhere in the OCA chart, so I don't think there's any assumption that OCA would weigh in on the town manager, hiring a town manager, but it does feel to me as if the council actively put in a reference to a charter section, which is fairly brief relative to some sections of the charter that we'd expect that OCA would weigh in on any of these. Uh, that said, um, I don't envision that OCA would use the process that we have been using for committee appointments for this appointment. And so um, I think our advisory role would be fairly limited. Uh, I think in the future, uh, it, it would make sense for OCA to be involved beyond just one member consulted uh, individually. Uh, but in this situation we're in right now, uh, unless I hear otherwise from my committee members, and I hope I, I hear something from them, uh, I don't necessarily know what OCA uh, could offer additionally in this moment. Okay, we need a motion. Mandy Jo. I move per section 2.9A of the charter to appoint Athena O'Keefe, an existing employee of the town as clerk of the council, effective July 1, 2019. Further, to instruct the town manager to take the necessary steps to ensure that the council's decision is carried out. Is there a second? I second it. Any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand and stay aye. 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 Opposed? All right, well, just on that chance, Athena, come forward, please. We have to swear her. Ha, <laughs> ha, 
<laughs> it's so cute. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to faithfully and impartially affirm, perform, and perpetuate the duties and responsibilities of the May I, may I ask a follow-up to that? Please. So perhaps given that there, there are little things that need to be worked out in terms of how exactly this position is going to work from the town manager, which he will report back to us, once we have that information and then we take that plus what was in rules plus what the charge says, then OCA could have a conversation about where we fit in this process, perhaps separate from our full charge and re-looking at the whole thing, but to be able to put all those piece parts together just so that we don't lose track. Because like we said, we worked on the rules with Margaret specifically for this. Now we have a job description. Now we may have a little tweaking that happens associated with the town manager's part. And then OCA could look at that and report back where we are coming next, if that sounds reasonable. OK. Um, committee reports. Many of these we have taken care of tonight because they have led to actions. But very quickly, audit. Nothing. Bylaw review. Community. Evan? Nothing new. Community Resource Committee. No report. Uh, goals ad hoc, none. Finance Committee. We will be taking up the uh, percent for arts uh, at our next meeting, a matter referred to us. We have not had the opportunity to really discuss it. And uh, we did have a discussion at our last meeting with the chair of uh, OCA about the appointment process for resident members of the committee. Uh, but that gets turned back over to OCA. And I understand OCA will report on that at its next meeting. Let's get something to say now. Evan? OCA did vote today to recommend uh, three people to be the non-voting resident members of the Finance Committee. Uh, you can expect to see a written report on those for our next meeting. And a motion. OK. Uh, GOL? Um, I just want to point out the report we have 45 days to report on the rules, and so that is up soon. Um, so we, on what was referred to us from the Rules Committee and the Council, our report says we're still working on it. We hope to have draft revised rules by the 22nd, and then the other stuff will continue on. Okay. Oka? That's it. That's it? Okay. We're on to approval of minutes. We're going to do a joint thing on June, minutes for June 17th and minutes for June 24th. Um, the motion is to approve the minutes of the June 17th town council meeting and the minutes of the June 24th, 2019 open meeting of the residents as presented. Is there a motion? Second. Further discussion, changes, corrections? Okay. Then all those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? And absent. So there's one abstention and one absent. So it's 11 one eleven zero one one. All right. Um, Town manager's report. Thank you. Um, happy new fiscal year. I know everybody's a little groggy from fiscal New Year's Eve. Um, so um, we have a lot of searches going on right now for the director of senior services, uh, for the town clerk. Um, and it's, I will have a recommendation for the director of senior services that I will deliver to you on Monday, July 8th. That will uh, I talked with the uh, chair of OCA this morning about the timing of that. That allows the council to be able to weigh in prior to the 14-day expiration uh, of the department head appointment. Uh, I've, uh, so we have a candidate. I, I've made a job offer contingent on 
the review by the town council. Um, and the search for the town clerk is ongoing. We basically just revved up the machine that was happening a year ago, and uh, they're up and searching for a, a town clerk at that, for that as well. Uh, the, uh, the third position that you may have seen is David Burgess, who is the principal assessor who's, uh, who's retired, uh, but his intention and my desire is for him to come back on a part-time basis to fulfill the function of the principal assessor on a part-time basis, which he is permitted to do under the retirement laws. Uh, he had intended to work for another year or so, and uh, due to some other situations, he decided to retire now, but wanted to continue working. And this will give us some other opportunities to um, transition, give us a little bit longer glide path into a, tr a long-term transition. The um, Independence Day is the next big event, which is uh, on July 4th, obviously. And South Amherst Common has a major event, which is always a terrific event that people like to go to. Uh, the fireworks and the festivities by, uh, at UMass will be a little bit different this year because where we normally have the event behind the stadium is now being, is a construction site now getting ready for a new indoor football field. And we will be, if you are on University Drive, this will be to the left of the stadium. The thing that will, the two major changes this year is there will be a, a beer garden that's available, much like the Taste of Amherst. This is located in the town of Hadley, so they're the permitting authority for this, and the university owns the property. And uh, there will also, uh, the town of Hadley and the state police will be closing Route 116 from yes. about 6 o'clock until about 10 o'clock. They have experienced previously for the Amherst fireworks that a lot of people like to stop in, on Route 116 and observe the fireworks, and the uh, police uh, found that that was a potentially dangerous situation in terms of cars and pedestrians mixing on a road that's a divided highway. So they will be closing that. That will cause some inconvenience to people, uh, but they will be, there's, we've added police um, uh, direction uh, officers, uh, both in Amherst and in other part in Hadley as well, to help get, help people get around that situation. Um, this morning, I had the privilege of uh, having uh, the town clerk swear in three new firefighters uh, who have started work today, and that's really good news for us. You know, we have had some unexpected uh, retirements or resignations, and when you uh, when that happens unexpectedly, it creates a crunch for our firefighters because it takes about 10, 10 12 weeks to train a new firefighter. We had already been in process for hiring these, these uh, officers, these firefighters, um, and we had a, a list that we could choose from. So this is opportunist, opportune. They, can't, they won't be fully um, um, available as a standalone firefighter for a couple months, though, unfortunately. But they start their training today. They were out there doing all the things that they were uh, supposed to be doing, learning to drive the amb our ambulances and things like that. So good news, three new firefighters on duty as of today. Um, the um, Ranked Choice Voting Committee is having its first meeting next Tuesday. Uh, and it's, it's, you're all invited to come if you'd like, but it's a, it's a pretty strong group that uh, will be organizing itself. Uh, the town clerk, the temporary town clerk is a, is a member and will be is managing that process. And so that meeting's been posted and they have a pretty big uh, task ahead of them because they have a deadline uh, to, to meet. And, but I think that they have a lot of people who have experience in ranked choice voting. There's also a, a um, a discussion on ranked choice voting later in July at UMass, which I'll share with you. So if you're interested in that, people can go to that. That's an open, that's open to the public as well. Um, we are, we've done a lot of appointments, but we still have vacancies. So we're going to sort of reconnoiter where we are um, and in terms of where our vacancies are, we're going to make, make another push for uh, advertising to the public, say here's where we still need people. For instance, we talked about participatory budgeting commission, uh, public art commission. So we'll go out and sort of advertise to folks again to say, we still, we still need you, and we often have vacancies throughout the year, so it's always good to have a pool of, ca of candidates who are expressing interest in serving. Um, the Kendrick Park, we had, uh, the planning department had a public meeting to explore the idea of having a playground on, in Kendrick Park. 
This is something that the town had looked at previously. We intend to go for a grant to, per, to pay for this uh, playground, and we're hopeful that it'll be funded. It, it's it's the, the only way the, the, this park at this point in time would move forward is if we received a sizable grant for it. One of the things I've heard multiple times uh, from people as we talked mostly about the, uh, the North Common was the lack of play space for young children downtown. People come downtown with their children to get a slice of pizza or get ice cream, and there's no place really to go for them to expend some energy. And so that's something we're, we hope to address. Uh, Station Road Bridge. We've, if you've been down there, we bought a bridge. It's sitting there. Uh, we have poured the concrete, and the way it works is the concrete has to cure. It, um, it has to, uh, they pour the concrete and then they pour some test cylinders and then they take out the test cylinders and they put that, they subject that to pressure every week um, until it can survive 4,000 uh, PSI. Um, and so they, they tested one today and it broke at less than four, they tested they test five at a time. Uh, they tested less than 4,000. Uh, so next Monday they'll test again. They're, fairly confident uh, that these will test, they will all survive the 4,000 uh, PSI test. In that case, we have everyone lined up next week to install, install the bridge, which requires a crane to um, do the um, paving that allows people to get up over the bridge to install the guardrails and to install signs. So weather permitting and are these, these concrete cylinders surviving um, we'll be doing that next week, and that should take about four or five days to do. So we're optimistic that that will move forward pretty soon. Um, the um, Puffer's Pond is closed as of today. We will, they tested the water again. We will know tomorrow if it will, we're allowed to reopen. This happens periodically during the summer. It, it's usually because of runoff. It's not because of... Um, human behavior, it's because of heavy rains and runoff, and um, this, week, this weekend wasn't helpful necessarily, um, but because of a heavier than normal concentration of E. coli, we closed the, both sides of the of Puffer's Pond. The um, traffic, has, people have been learning about the new one-way traffic. We've added signage to help guide people. We've had police patrols up there, and more as an educational, um, tool, and um, so I think that that's going to work out pretty well. People are getting used to the new parking alignment. They're taking advantage of the, of the nose-in parking, which, which um, increases our, uh, the number of cars that we could have on the roadway. So I think that's all working pretty well. Um, I think Fourth of July weekend will be a real test, especially because it's supposed to be hot. There'll be a lot of people coming up. It's a place that, they, that a lot of folks come from all over Western Mass to take advantage of Puffer's Pond. It's a um, so it's very popular, and uh, we have added patrols up there from police and from our conservation officers. And we have one of our parking enforcement officers uh, swinging up there periodically as well, um, and also working the beach a little bit more than we have in the past, you know, to make sure that people are abiding by the rules that are at Puffer's Pond in terms of no alcohol and things like that. So um, that's what I want to report on. Questions? Yes. Mandy Jo. Do we have a timeline on when Groff's renovations might be done? What, Groff? Groff Park? Uh, it started, we started to see some vertical, uh, it starts going up. I don't have the timeline on that. It's, it's, it's probably a couple weeks, so. Darcy? Um, I just want to say that I really look forward to the town manager report and, and enjoy it very much. <laughs> Um, and think it's one of the most valuable documents that we have. I've been sharing it at our at my district meetings because it just tells everything. Um, and um, I want I have one question and a comment. Um, the comment is that I I did like it back when you had a section that was entitled sustainability. You always have stuff in there about sustainability, but um, I think it would be great to you know, mm -hmm. have that label. Um, and um, I also wanted to ask you about the contract with Amherst Community Television. And there, you 
said in the report that it was that the contract was going to be adjusted, uh, you know, as per needs of the town council. And I just wondered if you could give us more detail about that. Sure. So we did have a meeting with uh, members of the board of directors and the director of uh, Amherst Media, basically because the current contract had a provision in it that allowed us to reopen it if we changed our form of government because it calls for coverage of the uh, select board and things like that. And we want to have reach clarity with them about what meetings that they are actually going to be covering and what their capacity was to cover them. And I think it's a very productive meeting. Where it stands now is the, the ball's in my court where I'm going to make res uh, changes to the contract, send it over to Amherst Media, they're going to review the changes. They're pretty um, straightforward. Instead, where it says select board, it will say, or town meeting, it will say town council. We want to call out the um, public forums that are required in the charter. All the things that are required in the charter, we want to make sure that it's in the contract that they're going to cover so there's no question going forward. Um, so. so they're not covering the committees of the council? No, they have a hard, they express that they have a hard time covering daytime meetings because they rely a lot on volunteers to record the meetings. The, the, currently they're required to cover the finance committee meetings. That's the only thing that's in the contract itself. If we were to contract for additional meetings or of committees, we would probably, they would probably look for some compensation on that. One more. Uh, one more yes, go ahead. Um, uh, so is there a way that we could get some kind of um, agreement with the IT department about how fast they can get up the, the um, videos of the council meetings? Mm -hmm. So we talked about that as well with, with Amherst Media and about who, who can do that the best. I mean, Amherst Media has the best equipment to put in uh, the taglines that you want to see so you know what you're watching and things like that. It takes several hours for them to do one of those things. So after there's a meeting, it gets downloaded. Um, it takes time for them to do it. And they have, they've laid off a person in their office in their, uh, uh, recently. Um, so it's just about staff capacity at their level in terms of being able to turn it around. They prioritize this meeting and being able to turn this one around as quickly as possible. Committee meetings are lower priority, quite frankly. Evan. Uh, so regarding Station Road Bridge, mm -hmm. obviously we got a little bit behind what we were hoping for for the temporary bridge. Uh, I'm looking at the permanent bridge schedule, which has, you know, advertised bid award beginning August 19th. Um, is the delay for the temporary bridge also, also pushing back the permanent bridge schedule, or is there an anticipation that this will stay on schedule? Right. So we would, the intent is not to move on the permanent bridge until we get state funding. So we'll be putting funds requests in, and the, the state bridge program is a little messed up, honestly. And so once they uh, are looking for um, applications, again, we'll be putting in for this bridge. Any other questions at this time? Alyssa? Most falls under unanticipated, and I'm actually going to look to our new OCA chair for this, but we just heard a report, much to my surprise, that we are going to be getting a, a department head appointment in for, that, that has the 14-day clock, and OCA doesn't have a meeting between now and the 22nd. And so that means it wouldn't be possible for OCA to give you a recommendation on that, except if we meet that morning, the 22nd. And so I guess I would ask although I would defer to you. Um, my initial instinct would be to ask if the town council, we, we're not gonna have a written report for you. There's no chance of that. We're not gonna be able to schedule an additional meeting based on it coming out next week. And so what is the town council's pleasure associated my with that? My assumption is that an oral report will suffice. We literally won't have time to talk about it at all until that morning for the first time. That's fine. We'll have the town, we will have the town manager's memo because that comes to all of us. And so it's not as if we'll be working with no knowledge. So what we will ask for is an oral summary of OCA's discussion and your recommendation. Yeah. Because we're not scheduling any more meetings either. Any other questions? Okay, very quickly, there are two things. 
Um, there's an updated evaluation timeline for the town manager's evaluation. Um, I mentioned earlier uh, that we took uh, a little longer to get it moving out, but it does not affect your timeline. But the reason we did that was because of converting things to use of Survey Monkey, which allows us to compile stuff a lot faster. And uh, then uh, Lisa actually did some editing on it. So I just wanted to mention that everything is still on track and you were provided with the timeline. Um, the other thing that has come up recently is the whole issue of timeline and key milestones for adopting zoning bylaws and other bylaws and using a piece of a document that um, actually is part of a book that our um, Bob Ritchie is writing. We've now met and started adding into that the pieces that are part of our um, rules of procedure and also the charter and hope to be able to present that back to the council. But in the process, let me just say that is why we delayed because in doing that, we it was determined and also even before that was determined that because we did not hold a joint hearing with the planning board regarding the zoning bylaws, we had to go through the complete process of re-advertising with all of the same people that the planning board had already advertised with. So this in no way reflects on the uh, bylaw review committee. It's just a matter of abiding by the law. Um, other than that, I have nothing else. But going on to future items, I do want to mention that we do at some point need to figure out how to address the issue of permission to fly additional flags. Uh, because it was not specifically mentioned in the um, policy with regard to um, public ways. And uh, it did come up, though we went ahead and did approve it uh, to fly the flag that we're flying now. And are there other future agenda items? Andy Joe. I just want to state that I, as chair of GOL, I've received a couple of comments on that, and so it will go on to our future agenda items to review the public ways policy to make sure um, to figure out a recommendation on flags on the okay. flagpoles and also commemorative flags throughout town. Thank you. Other comments on future agenda items? Okay, Councilor comments? Yes. Uh, I just wanted to remind people that uh, about the Google form that the OCA sent out with regard to um, counselor outreach. We have uh, five of us have completed it, so we're waiting for, for everyone else to get that in so we can just get information out to people about what everybody's doing and what we can do better. Okay, thank you. Other questions, other comments? All right, do I hear a motion? There is no executive session. There are no other topics. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? George doesn't want to adjourn? Come on. Second. 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 Andy second. All those in favor? Raise aye. aye. Opposed? Abstain? Oh, thank you. Thank you very much.